I think we may start because it's 2 p.m. already. Yeah. yeah. Maybe give me a minute. I want to share my screen. Uh, So suppose everybody can see my screen, All right? Awesome. Yeah. So yeah, welcome everybody to uh, TEXR. This is the third edition of the workshop on 3D content creation for simulated training in extended reality. Uh, this workshop discusses and articulates research and uh, uh, visions on using the latest extended real technologies for educational and training purposes and on creating immersive digital visual content for delivering effective and personalized training experiences. Uh, the workshop is organized by Dr. Craig Wu, who is an associate uh, professor at George Mason University. Uh, me, Christos Musas, who is uh, one an assistant professor at Purdue University. Dr. Ryan Mamahan, who is an associate professor at the University of Southern Florida, and Dr. Konstantinos Kumatidis, who is an associate professor at Orhus University. Uh, this workshop targets at bringing together research and experts in VR and AR, uh, computer graphics and human computer interaction to discuss uh, research challenges in creating visual training experiences uh, to be delivered through state of the art extended reality. Uh, technologies and uh, specific topics uh, of interest include, but are not limited to 3D content offering for extra training, uh, instructional design and personalized uh, personalization for extra training, case studies of applying uh, VR and AR training and education, haptics for extra training, and more. Uh, uh, this is the schedule of uh, this. Uh, uh, year's workshop, we will have uh, two keynote speakers and uh, uh, a paper presentation session. Uh, this year, the workshop is hosting uh, six papers in a single session and two keynote presentation. Feel free to use Discord to ask questions uh, both to presenters uh, of the papers and the keynote speakers. And Zoom attendees can also raise their hand to directly ask questions. Uh, we approximate that each paper presentation, along with a short Q&A, will not exceed 10 minutes. Uh, so as mentioned, uh, we're hosting two keynote speakers, uh, uh, Dr. Benjamin Locke from the University of Santa Florida and Dr. Uh, Sabaris Babu from Clemson University. And uh, so without further ado, let me introduce you to the first keynote speaker, Dr. Benjamin Locke. So Dr. Benjamin Locke is a professor in the Computer Information Science and Engineering Department at the University of Florida and entrepreneur, uh, having previously co-founded Shadow Hell, now it's part of Elsevier. Professor Locke's research focuses on using virtual uh, humans and mixed reality to train communication skills within the area of uh, virtual environments, human-computer interaction, and computer graphics. Uh, Professor Locke received a PhD and a master's degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and a bachelor's degree in computer science from the University of Tulsa. Uh, Tulsa. Uh, he did a postdoc uh, fellowship under Dr. Larry Hodges. Uh, Professor Locke received the University of Florida Innovator of the Year Award in 2019. And he and his students in the Virtual Experience Research Group have received Best Paper Award at Intelligent Virtual Agents. Uh, conference, IWVR conference, and uh, ACM I3D conference. Uh, Dr. Benjamin Locke will give us a presentation titled Measuring What Matters, Lessons Learned from uh, Taking Virtual Patients for Training uh, from Research to Realization. So, Benjamin, uh, the floor is yours. I will stop sharing now. Okay. All right. Um, I do need screen sharing capabilities, please. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Can you do this? All right. Yes. Looks like it's good. Okay. Awesome. Great. Great. Thanks again okay. for the opportunity to come talk to you. 
I told them this is going to be a slightly different keynote talk. Okay, my hope is not for me to just to rattle off a bunch of research results. Um, I, you know, I can point you to stuff, uh, but I do want to use this as an opportunity to talk to my talk to perhaps a younger version of, of me, uh, which is you know a lot of you are much, probably much younger than me. I've been uh, going to VR since two thousand three, and I wanted to try to encourage everybody here to think about what are you measuring with your work. Okay, what, what, when you think about, is your work valuable? Is your work useful? How are you measuring that? Because what I thought about whenever I, I'm going to talk to you, to you about my journey that has uh, taken virtual patients from a research uh, idea to a commercial product and then uh, me uh, leaving, uh, exiting the company, uh, what did I learn from all that, all right? So hopefully this is a start for some of you to, if you were to talk to yourself in five years, uh, you know, like somehow you could come back in time. They said, this was the start of a journey that you started taking that made you really reflective of what it is that you measure from your work. So that's my hope. We'll see whether we get there. Okay. Um, I do have a conflict of interest, uh, the company Elsevier. Um, I do receive royalty payments from Elsevier for the sh sale of shadow health simulation products for nursing schools. Uh, so um, I won't be talking about Elsevier uh, significantly in this talk, but I do need to say that I do have a conflict of interest there. I personally like it if you, if, if people um, threw in questions in the chat, I, 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 I much rather answer questions that are coming up because it makes me feel like one, people are paying attention, but two, I can be much more useful if I can be dynamic in responding to uh, people's questions. Okay, so again, if you want to add anything to the chat, please throw them in there. I'm very, very happy to answer. And again, apologies. I've got three puppies in here and they start barking really loud. I'm sorry, uh, just disregard. Okay, uh, today's goals is I wanted to present to you some few questions that I've struggled with throughout my career. Uh, people have asked me th these questions and I've started thinking about them. I have thought about them sometimes for 15, 20 years long. Um, so I'm going to, and, and I'm going to frame that through the discuss, through this journey of taking virtual patients training from research to realization. So I'm going to make that relevant to this, to this uh, workshop, but I want us to really think about measure, measurement and measuring what matters and really encouraging everybody here. This is the too long, did not listen part. I want to encourage everybody here to define your own metrics of success for your research and for your career and go after them, because I think that that's, um, I, I found that to be a, the, the one lesson that I've learned of actually taking things out into the real world. But I also want to hear from you real fast. So if you could go into the chat, I would like to know how can I be most valuable to you during this keynote talk, this, this 30, I mean, this uh, um, 35 minutes that, that are allocated till 245. So um, how can I be useful? And just a little background myself, I'm an, uh, I've been in the VR, AR, MR space for 25 years. Uh, I do a lot of work with virtual humans for soft skills training, uh, specifically persuasive virtual humans now. It's been all, uh, trying to get people to pursue healthy behaviors, but also had an experience of translating that research to the marketplace. And when I started, I did not know anything about um, um, entrepreneurship or why somebody would even want to take something out, but it's become uh, one of the funnest uh, components of my career and, and, and time that I spend now. I brought research to market. I've, then taught, uh, I've been taking that, st that start startup mindset back into academia and really trying to apply that to some of the work that we do here. And I really want to help others get your word out, get your ideas out. So even after this talk, if you have ideas that you are thinking about getting out there, and getting out there does not mean starting a company necessarily. It means many, many different things. If you would love to, if you'd like to have um, some, some further conversations just to learn and discuss more. I'm happy to do that. I do that with, uh, with teams and researchers all over the US, but I'm happy to do that with people, um, happy to uh, connect with you. But I'd love to hit a pause here. Think about this talk, this next 30 minutes, 35 minutes. How can I be valuable to you? Please throw it in the chat because I will then make sure I'll incorporate some of your um, answers to my slide and uh, incorporate some of the slide content to cover your questions. I usually wait here until I get at least one question in the chat. Not one.
What's the best way for <laughs> best way to, for Professor Stark? I'll, I'll throw. I'll address that question uh, when we get to the transition point. Yep, absolutely. Anything else that people want to think about? If you do add more questions, why we don't invest in virtual humans for training? Oh, great, great, great question. We're going to definitely tap into that. If you think of more, add them into the chat. I will make sure I will try to get to these questions. If I don't, just flag me again as I sometimes get excited and I want to make sure I answer these questions. Okay, so this title, Measure What Matters, I, mean, I didn't make that up. It came from a book by John Doerr. It's a great book. Uh, when should one leave academia? Ooh, that's a that's a that's an interesting question. Oh, I'm asking in Discord. Oh, okay. Uh, well, you see yourself in different countries, life cycle. Oh, cool. So many different questions. Oh, this is so exciting. Much, much more fun this way. Okay. <clears throat> but real fast, the title Measure What Matters was inspired by John. Uh, it's a book by John Doerr. He talks about this concept of objectives and key results. It's a super fast read. I highly recommend it. It's used by companies like Google, Intel, Bono, the Gates Foundation. The audiobook has some really cool uh, voice talent that, that reads the chapters. So I highly recommend it. But this book really makes uh, started me thinking about, are we measuring what matters, right? Because here's a, here's a spoiler alert. I think most of the things that we get told to measure don't really matter. And it distracts us from the really cool stuff. Okay. Oh, great, Craig. I'm definitely want to tap on that. So let's go ahead and continue this interactive part because this is what I like doing. Uh, what are the metrics you use to measure if the training you're creating is important? So I'm going to put this for um, this this link into the chat. Okay, here we go. Here's the form, and you please go to the form, and when you click on the link, you'll just see it's got one question. So it, it won't take you very long. Oh. Okay, and it's just that same question. What are the metrics? Everything was. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, should I? I should have been in Discord. Sorry, um, I just looked. Yeah, that that's my fault. Um, yeah, if you could click on the link and just fill in this one question, I'll, I'll, I'll pause for about 30 seconds. But the question is, hey, we're, we're all here thinking about how can we improve training using some XR technology, right? So how do we measure if what we're doing is important? Funny. All right, I started to see some of the responses coming in. I'm going to create a word cloud uh, in a little bit. Um, let me give everybody about another uh, 15 seconds here. All right. And thank you for humoring me because I love seeing the different responses to this question. Okay, all right, we'll continue on. Um, okay, so these are the things that I, um, you know, when, when I think about things that, that, that I've measured uh, throughout my career, these are my, some of the things that came up because I, I put some stuff in uh, from my own work into Word Cloud and things like this. Oh, it's about awaiting awards or getting funding. If you're in an academia, you understand funding is a big part of the game. And you can see grants and papers, H index, seems to be really important, right? People um, have been doing a lot of tenure and promotion reviews and that, that, that comes up. Uh, so let me go and tell you a story, uh, start you back. This is back in my, during my dissertation work, this is back in about 2001, 2002 timeframe. And back then uh, in virtual reality, when you put on a head mounted display, if you look down at your hands, for example, you didn't see yourself, right? And a lot of us know why, right? There's no tracking going on. And so what, how would the system know what to show you? So my initial PhD work um, was to use a set of cameras and the GPU, which was one of the first ones to use a, a, a hardware accelerated approach to generate convex hulls, which are uh, three-dimensional shapes um, so, uh, that are generated from silhouettes to create uh, three real-time avatars for the user. And here, so those are really my hands when I was a graduate student. Uh, I had that interacting with a cloth simulation that's the curtain and you can open up the cloth and look outside. And I was really, really proud of this work. It was this real time avatar reconstruction. I had a publication came out of it. It's my first publication that was at I3D. And then I showed that to my advisor, which is Dr. Brooks. Uh, Dr. Brooks said, I won't sign off on your dissertation until you find someone who needs what you created. 
I don't know about you, but if your advisor said this to you, I see Matias laughing. If somebody said that they're not going to sign off your dissertation until you find somebody to find it useful, um, I was distraught to say the least. I, I grabbed some of my friends. We went to the uh, to the bar, and they were trying to console me because they're like, "Dude, I don't know what you're going to do." Because I was so proud of myself, but then in just one sentence, he totally changed my world. Right. Um, and so one of the people, though, that was uh, that was there with me, I was talking with her. Her name is, uh, she's now Dr. Be uh, Danette Allen. She worked at NASA. And she goes, hey, Ben, you know, this real-time reconstruction is actually really, really useful for some of our engineers because they don't know whether they can, in, when they design a CAD drawing, they don't know whether they can actually reach in there and actually construct it when it comes time to really do it. And it's really important when you're doing space payloads because you have to be, you have a very constrained environment. So again, what I thought I was done, I had a publication. Why would Dr. Brooks ask me to find someone who would use my work? Was I measuring what mattered? Because I thought publications was what mattered, right? That's, that's what mattered. So what I worked with Don, uh, Danette Allen, she actually got her NASA colleagues to come down to UNC and she gave me 3D models of, um, I do hear extra voice, which is totally cool. I've got three young kids, so that doesn't bother me, but other people might. Uh, be aware of that. Um, anyways, so Don, uh, Danette got four of her NASA engineers to come down. She gave me 3D models from NASA, and we actually generated here on the right. Uh, this is actually a 3D model of um, from from a NASA payload that was going up, and we actually allowed their users to see whether their hands would be able to fit in and install certain components. And they actually found that there are certain stages that they couldn't do. So that was really interesting. Um, that the same concept of moving virtual curtains with my graduate student hands, if you replace my hands with a um, NASA operator's hands and 3D models of a curtain with a NASA uh, 3D model, all of a sudden this work became much more interesting to a lot of people, right? And the only difference was whose hands they were. It was, it, so I was like, wow, that's really interesting. How was I so excited about this? Because cloth simulation, 3D hands, how cool is that? And then all of a sudden, once I told people I'm having, helping NASA actually help construct satellites, everybody thought that project was so much more interesting, right? So it really kind of got me started thinking. Um, and I, I graduated because Dr. Brooks signed off on it. It's a nice person and buddy, kept his word. And then I started at the University of Florida um, back in 2003. So I've been here 19 years. And in my second year here at UF, I met uh, Paul Fishwick, who is a mentor of mine. He's now at UT Dallas. I know Ryan knows, knows him very well. And um, Paul asked me one time, we were sitting in his office, and he goes, Ben, what would be a successful career to you? Right? Pretty simple, should be a simple question, right? And then maybe we start thinking, oh, well, if I got tenure, and he goes, no, 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 Ten tenure, that, that, that's not a successful career, right? I mean, six, what would that look like to you? And the answer is, I didn't have a good answer for him back in 2004. And I've been really working at that question for this entire time. Like, well, what does that mean? And hopefully some of the younger folks on, on this call will, will start this journey earlier than I did, which is what would be a successful career, right? Uh, because I tell you what I get told to value, right? When I was in school, the things I was told to really pay attention to were my grades, if I got standardized test scores, or my, the rank of the school, whether I had publications because I needed to get a job. Then after graduation, once I started then at UF, um, yeah, yeah. So, so um, yeah, happy to, and if people could just uh, post some of the questions in, into this chat, that'd be great. So after graduation, I really will look at things such as my salary, right? That's what my parents were really interested about. Like, how much are you making, right? What, what's your title? What, what's the reputation of your school? Uh, what's your age index? If you want to get a uh, tenure promotion, what, how many awards? These are things that I but, you know, was told to measure. Okay, so we're going to hit pause there. Now we're going to talk about this training component or about the research results that has taken down this pathway from virtual patient research, which we started in 2004. Uh, can people learn to communicate from virtual human patients? That was a very simple question, right? So could people, now back in 2004, you got to remember, we were not talking to our Alexas in series. We were not, um, you know, the virtual characters that we were using back then were still, uh, were quite rudimentary. Um, and in 2008, we actually started thinking about curricular integration of virtual human patients into the actual training of real people. Um, so that, that's, that, that's been a major step. And in 2011, 
um, somebody said, hey, you should probably disclose your invention to the university because they, they want you to do that. I said, I don't really have any time for any of this, but sure. They, they put me in contact with somebody uh, to, who ended up being the CEO of the company, uh, Shadow Health. They licensed it. And um, we'll talk a little bit more of the research about training for teams with virtual humans. But over the over uh, 10 now, now entering its 11th year, uh, half of all nursing students in the US and Canada are now trained using virtual human patients. So if you live in the US and Canada, I can guarantee you, I'll, the vast majority of you, almost every single person in the, uh, in the US and Canada has been treated by somebody trained by virtual human patients. So this is one of the examples of technology, training technology that has moved from the research realm in training with XR into the real world and having real world impact. And I thought about, oh, what can we learn from this process? And again, if you wanna add, ask questions, please jump on in. Okay, so let's jump into virtual patient research. Well, what is this? Thing that we started doing. Back in 2004, we said, can interacting with a virtual person improve your interactions with real people? Right? I mean, think about it. There's, how do we train people to interact with other real people? Right? Hopefully, a lot of us do this on a somewhat regular basis. We interact with humans. Uh, most of the ways we do this is actually um, very high risk uh, situ uh, situations, right? We don't get many times to practice. We often do role playing with other people, but this can be very, very problematic for a lot of domains. And so here's an example. If a person that looked like her walked up to you uh, and said, what would you say to her? Right? So you can see here, we've got a virtual character. Hopefully it's evident on your screen. Maybe I can shrink this thing down just a little bit so you, it becomes a little bit bigger on yours. But you can see that one of her eyes is eyelids that have closed. And if you can look very closely, her eyes are not focused correctly. Head. One's actually off to the side. Okay. So there are actually two scenarios that could happen, could, could uh, result from this. Number one, she could go home and just sleep it off because it's something that's nothing really major. You take a couple of Tylenol, go sleep it off. The other option, this is, this is actually correct, is um, she has to go to the emergency room because she might be having an aneurysm and could die if she leaves the hospital. So you have, it, it is actually a stark choice fork in the road and the way you actually know which one which route to take is you have to ask her the right questions such as um, you know when did the pain begin does it get better if you tilt your head or lie down these are the standard questions but people have to know what questions to ask you would agree that it's probably a good idea to be able to practice this and fail here in simulation i think I'm not, I'm not surprising people here, but that training is important, but I think we'd all agree, hey, we really want to practice these situations. Um, so what would you say to her? And then the thing that I was really interested in was were you empathetic when you said this to her, right? So how can we train not only just the, the critical thinking, can we train soft skills? Can we get people to care about each other more through using technology, right? So we started doing virtual patient research in 04. Um, you know, we, we wanted to really look at uh, health profession students communicate with virtual patients. I'm going to show you a video of what the technology looked like back then. The Virtual Patients Project is a joint effort by researchers at the University of Florida, the Medical College of Georgia, the University of Central Florida, and the University of Georgia. The aim of the Virtual Patients Project is to provide medical students training in patient-doctor communication. Our goal is for interaction with the virtual patient to be modeled after standardized patient experiences. To achieve this high level of immersion, we focus on developing virtual characters that appear life-size, understand a limited set of natural language, and respond to touch. To conduct the patient interview, the student can naturally speak to and touch the virtual patient. We are designed for virtual patients to complement existing curriculum that relies on lecture, role playing, and performing well observed by experts. Okay, I'm gonna go hit pause there. So this is 2006. So you look at PlayStation 2 quality virtual characters, uh, the technology, the, the, the speech to text was really rough, as you can imagine back then. That was a, a tough time. Um, 
But what did we learn, right? Well, we learned that you can actually practice soft skills with virtual characters. So I know a lot of you are thinking training. Um, a lot of you think about virtual humans, which are investing virtual humans for training. I'm very, very interested in the social aspects of these virtual characters. And so um, I know there's a lot of great work in things like crowd simulation and things like that, but I really wanted to look at the, the, the soft skills. And, and, I, and I would just encourage a lot of folks that there's so much open ground uh, uh, to, to, to explore in this space, especially as our characters get more realistic, as our interfaces get so much better. But we were able to look at skills such as empathy. So what would you say if the virtual uh, patient said, I'm really scared, what if this is cancer? If that's a hard thing to respond to. And you can imagine if you're a 21, 22 year old student and you're having to talk to somebody who's probably uh, older than you and going has different life experiences, maybe from a different culture and different background, that's hard to do. Why do we thrust people in these situations without proper training? We don't do that with an airplane. We don't do that in a lot of other things, but we do this with humans. Why? Because we haven't developed things uh, that much better. So we're, that's one of my passions is to change that. Um, I, I don't know if I can afford the medication. Somebody said that to you. How would you respond? It's actually hard to respond to. Uh, and most likely the first few times you do it, it's going to be bad. So let's let people practice. Uh, we looked at bias, for example. And so if the character looked like this lady on the left versus this lady on the right, even though they might have exactly the same content, if they uh, people actually responded differently to when they expressed concern. Like, wow, that's really interesting that some of these social aspects are carrying on over the virtual characters. So hopefully these are some ideas when you're thinking about training in your applications, are you looking at some of these soft skills? Are you looking at empathy? Are you looking at bias? I think that there, there are, it's wide open space, a lot of places for people to go. Um, how can we improve in stressful situations? So here on the left, we actually worked with clinical breast exam. So not only do you have to learn how to, and this is a mannequin with sensors in it. So we, you are, but you also had to talk to the virtual character while you're doing this, uh, the, this exam. So you had to mix cognitive, social, and psychomotor skills together in training. So that's an opportunity to think about the training that you're doing. Can you mix different components, social, cognitive, psychomotor skills, combine it together? I think it's a really rich place to do stuff. If you ever Google my name, um, I, I wish I was known for a bunch of other things, but we actually did a prostate exam and this image popped up on, uh, somebody will send it to me, especially on my Facebook uh, uh, page, we'll repost it because they find it hilarious. But um, there is, we, we did a prostate exam and we actually had the same sort of scenarios, but how do you train somebody to talk to somebody and convince them that they need to do a prostate exam? Because typically most people don't want to have a prostate exam, and you know, a lot of the a lot of the practitioners are not excited about it either. So it's a very stressful situation. So think about stressful situations when in your training, are you able to create these situations where people can work at uh, their community their skills uh, in these situations? Um, so I want to make sure that I. Uh, stay on time. But here's uh, we also did work with team training. So when you think about can you work, uh, can you train people to be part of a team? So I'm gonna play this video. Here you have one human and three virtual humans. And we actually had so, a plug and play system where you could roll out one of these characters. These are TVs with a Microsoft Connect to top, but you can see them actually working about team skills here. So I'm going to hit pause there, but you can see here we actually had a, a, an ability for people to work on their team building skills. And this one's really interesting because the people around the, the in the operating room, they have different levels of power. So they, they call it a power gradient. Some people are very low on that tone on, on that power gradient, such as nurses, and then some people are very, very high, such as the surgeon, and that can cause uh, opportunities for bullying to happen. And so we were able to work on helping empower people that don't have power in certain situations on best practices to speak up uh, and, 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 and really improve both the culture, but also for patient safety. So anytime you can think about team training, especially around power gradients, it's really a great opportunity to, to um, say, hey, how do I empower people at the <laughs> that, that often... Uh, don't have the, the ability to speak up. How do I teach them best practices to speak up? Because we, um, you can get people to do that. So other areas for training, really thinking about training 
to improve interactions, not only with empathy and soft skills, but empathy with each other. So this, the, this concept of, of team training. Uh, other areas that we found out that training with virtual humans is really, really useful. So you, somebody asked, why should somebody invest in virtual humans for training? Uh, Chris, that's a great question. Here's some different other domains. So we, we heard soft skills, but we hear protected populations. So for example, you can't train with children. So how do you train pediatricians? It's actually really hard. They, they bring in each other's kids and practice talking to each other's kids. That's how pediatricians do that. That's very, very challenging, right? So there's often protected populations and groups that you're trying to train that you can't get access to. So people with psychiatric conditions, people uh, that might be incarcerated, for example, these are protected populations that, that you might need to uh, get training on and virtual humans plays a great role. Uh, discussing, discussing difficult topics. So we worked with nursing students to develop nonverbal and verbal skills with patients expressing suicidal ideation. How do you practice if somebody says, I'm really thinking about hurting myself? That's incredibly hard. I don't, I don't care how many times you've encountered that. It is a tough situation. How can we practice and give people an opportunity to work on their empathy skills? How can they learn from experts on how to respond better? Uh, and then we should also so think about difficult topics, think about protected populations, and think about curricular integration of abnormal findings. What that means is that there are things that people might or might not see and if we can guarantee that everybody sees them as part of training, that's a huge win. And so these are all, these are training opportunities that I want to encourage everybody here to look for uh, in their domains. Now, um, again, if you think about how how I was trained, whether how would I measure if this was good research, right? So this is, think about I doing all these research projects. How was I going to know it was a good idea? If I take a look at my end of the year review, this is what I got reviewed on, right? It's the number of graduates, uh, students I graduated, papers I published, how many people that were citing my work, funding, awards. But I had to ask, am I really being measured on what matters? Okay, especially the professors who might be on here. If your thought is like next year, it's everything I'm doing this year plus one more, I'm trying to write, write one more paper or one more grant. If that doesn't, if that's starting to crush your soul, um, stick around, <laughs> let's, 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 let's chat because I want to encourage people that it doesn't have to be that. So let's talk about this transition when virtual patients actually affects almost everyone. I say everyone, it's in the US, Canada, and I you know, appreciate this as an international audience. Um, so in 2011, 2010, 2011, I met this gentleman, his name is David Messias, and the UF tech licensing, I remember I said that I disclosed and then they, made, they, contact, they put me in contact with David, who's was a local entrepreneur, and he walked in and goes, hi, Professor Locke. I hear, you know, I, I read up a little bit of work you're doing. And he was like, this is so impressive. Hey, are those virtual humans the most important virtual humans to create? I said, uh, you might not be aware, but I am the world expert in virtual humans. I, I've got lots of grants. I've got lots of papers on this. It, these are important. He goes, oh, yeah, how do you know that? I, I don't know whether you heard me, uh, but I am the world expert. So just trust me that these are important. But the reality is I was, I had no clue. I mean, they were interesting, but were they the most valuable, right? Because if you're trying to start, a, if you're doing an entrepreneurial ex exploration, you wanna tackle the biggest problem. You wanna tackle the hardest, uh, the thing that has the biggest opportunity. And I just assumed that I'd have, because you know, obviously I had all these papers and all these grants. Uh, hmm. So this is what the technology sort of looks like once a company actually commercializes it. In 2012, the only virtual I'm going to jump forward a little bit so you can see what. What makes the pain worse? Well, I think it's when I'm doing something physical most of the time. In shadow health, students think of their own questions relevant to the patient context. In fact, our virtual patients can answer hundreds of thousands of questions. Our patient conversations also reward students for asking high quality questions. Better questions lead to better patient disclosures. These conversations are the force that drives Shadow Health. Shadow Health's patented conversation engine technology allows students to develop critical thinking, build confidence with their patient interviews. Okay, so um, there you see some, some the, this is again, this is a few years old. I should have brought in the newer one, but you can see here, things have changed a little bit. Now we're no longer using head mounts, Things like that, we're going to uh, more screen-based systems, right? So laptops, desktops, uh, obviously technology has advanced during this time. So speech to text is way better. Um, so we were able to do things like that. 
Um, and you see, but some of the ideas from academia also still made it through. For example, you see children here. So this was one of the first uh, products anywhere that allowed uh, people to practice with uh, ch uh, child virtual characters. So we had pediatric students that were created. So what were the stages? So when you, when you disclose to the university, they try to get somebody to license it. In my case, they contacted me with uh, David. David uh, said, hey, you wanna start a company? And I go, I have no idea what that means, so sure. Um, but now I actually reached out to my, P, uh, my postdoc advisor, Larry Hodges, who had co-founded a company. And then we had a long conversation. He said, Ben, one of the worst things you can do is get in the way of the company. You need the company to really not fail because of you. Because <laughs> you can be a presence that just comes in and just messes things up. So he goes, so you, you really need to learn from the other people who know much more about the business side than you do. You just have no clue. Uh, so we started in 2011. We had three employees. Uh, the other co-founder was Erica Transit, who was my postdoc um, and PhD student beforehand. Then he became my boss. So I always tell professors, be nice to your students because they can become your boss. You never know when that's going to happen. Uh, and we had our first product took us 18 months to build from scratch. We had that patented ideas, but it took us 18 months to build it. In the first semester, we had 170 students using virtual characters, which uh, that was really cool. I mean, 170 real students beginning trained at six universities, and boy, was the product terrible. It was so rough, and it, I, I'm very thankful for those people. But what we did is one of the important things is we spent four years learning where our training technology was going to fit into the ecosystem of nursing students. Because we had this cool technology, but we didn't understand nursing students. We didn't understand any nursing professors. We didn't understand curriculum committees or um, IT integrations or all those things that needed to happen. So we spent four years learning where our training technology was going to actually live and fit in a university or in a college or wherever it was going to be. And that's one of the lessons that I hope some of you pick up is that it takes time to learn where your training fits in. Just because it uses cool tech does not mean it fits into the workflow of your intended audience. So we spent four years, we grew up to about 80, 83 employees. We had three products. Um, it took us uh, a, a year to create a product, but, it, but at the end of 2015, we actually had 10,000 virtual patient experiences a month, which I mean, think about if, if I told you I had a study with end of 10,000, I think everybody here would be like, oh my gosh, what an opportunity, right? Today, uh, Elsevier purchased it at the end of 2020. There's over 200 employees now working on virtual patients. We have, they have 16 products, they're turning out four a year, and now there's over a million virtual patient experiences every month. So a million conversations of nursing students talking with virtual characters. Uh, there's over a million every month, which is really, really cool. Because, you know, I mean, to think where, you know, the number of additional opportunities that have been created. Now, what lessons have I learned from that? Well, one of the things I wanted everybody here to think about is really it transformed my thought about what is valuable. Because I had to, if for you to sell something and somebody give you money, they're, they want some value from it, right? They're, if it's not solving their problem, they're gonna fire you. Never had that problem when I was a researcher and I had somebody, you know, I, I ran a study and I just gave them something and they go, I'll test it out for you. And that's fine because nobody paying you any money. And if it sucked, that's like, eh, yeah, I see potential. And then that's it, right? Here, if you don't deliver value, you're, they, they'll fire you very quickly and they'll let you know about it on the way out and they'll post it on social media. So um, things that I thought about was how can we pivot to increase values? Let me, be, let me go ahead and uh, explain what that means. So one thing that we did was when we first started thinking about this, we said, hey, let's train medical students. We found out that there are more nursing students than medical students. And they have to learn about the same thing. There are 10 times the nursing students than medical students. So we had to, we thought about, can we maximize the users? Because if we could affect more people, that would be good. How could we maximize this distribution? You know, I'm a VR person. So of course, HMDs, right? Well, HMDs, the install base, even now is still not where we need it to be, right? For that. So we had to say, hey, if we went to laptop desktop, how can we still ensure the training and the virtualness benefits still, uh, still get conveyed? And then we have to think about how do we ma maximize value to our users? What do they really want more than anything? What I first thought was, oh, they want to train critical thinking and they want to train communication skills. Um, they needed clinical hours to get filled for their students. And it cost them a lot of money to do that. So if they could do that with our, with our simulation at whatever price, they saw value in that. So it's really understanding where your users see value in what you're creating. Um, the other concept that I wanted to 
put out there. I know we're running a, getting short on time, so I want to make sure I get get to it. This is the one concept I hope that some of the, some of the people um, really think about. That this transformed my thinking when I when we went to acad um, out of out of academia, which is trying to fail fast. I think a lot of us have heard this phrase like, "Hey, we got to try to fail fast," right? But a lot of us don't embrace it. What we mean by that, if you are an entrepreneur and you start a company, if you are starting to create the wrong product, you want to find out tomorrow, right? I mean, it sounds really bad because everybody says, I'm trying my best. Like, I know that. But if I'm paying you a salary and you're going down the wrong path, I want to know tomorrow. I don't want to know when I release it to the market in 12 months that it's a dud because I just paid you a year's worth of salary and now I'm never going to recoup that. I, would, I know it stinks to find out that what you're working on, your, your baby is ugly, but if your baby's ugly, you need to get told early. But we don't do that as researchers, right? So when are you gonna find out, if you are working on a research problem, when are you gonna find out that that research problem is the wrong problem to work on? And I encourage everybody here, it sucks because nobody wants to think about that, but I want you to think about if future you could come back and say, hey, this, this project you're working on, it won't get accepted. It won't get that grant that you're applying for. It won't get into that conference that you're aiming for. You need to change it. That would actually save you. It'd actually be worth a lot of money to you, right? We need to do that. So I would encourage everybody to put things in front of them on a daily basis to try to prove that you're going down the wrong path. And if you can't seem to fail for two months, maybe you're on the right path. But don't keep on searching for the right path in, a, in above itself. Because so learning how to fail fast, and I really want to encourage everybody to even today, after this call, like what can you do to test your hypothesis that you're working on an important problem and see whether you can get told, nope, you really aren't. Because that would save you days of your life. And that's valuable, right? Okay, so again, we're, we're, we're finishing up. So the point is, what did I me used to measure? I used to measure all these sort of metrics. Let me go tell you, what do I measure on now? So I had to reflect on who needs this? What makes a successful career? Are you working on the most valuable problems? And this is what I measure now. First one is there are actually people publishing uh, on, on Shadow Hall software. They're, they're studying it as a platform, an education platform and publishing it. And they will outpublish me uh, on, in, my, in my own career. So are you creating things that people would actually want to study that goes beyond what you can personally create? So you've accelerated the field. I, I love this picture because this is Taryn and Colton. They were two of the first employees at Shadow Health. They met there, they got married. And uh, when they were expecting their first baby, she, they actually left and went back to Seattle. When they, so she's in Seattle, I live in Florida. Uh, and, and she was delivering her first baby. They found out that two of the nurses that were helping deliver their child was trained by Shadow Health products which to me is just an absolutely, I mean, it was such a cool story. She actually messaged me after she recovered that, hey, two of the nurses that helped deliver my healthy baby were trained by the products that we created. That's what I hope, uh, you know, I want to encourage you to measure. Um, um, I'll, I'll leave you th with this idea, 600 million. That's how many patient encounters that the nursing students that are trained by Shadow Health every year will see when they graduate. So now, now I think they're, they're up to like 350,000 users every year uh, use Shadow Health products. And when they get out, they will see about 600 million patient encounters. So that's why I can say confidently, every single person in the US Canada, your life has been impacted by training using virtual characters. So I don't want you now, uh, you might say, well, how is that ever possible? My point is that I wanna encourage everybody here that you can choose the metrics that you wanna, your, you wanna be measured on. Don't go with, what you get told is so super important because I guarantee you um, the papers, the grants and all those other things that matter that, that you get told to value, they'll get, they'll get there just fine if you have these larger metrics. And I wanna say everybody here, whatever you're passionate about, use that as a metric for your career. That should be what you should be running to because all these other things will take care of itself and don't get distracted by what's at the end of the year report that you all have to fill out or file or, or send to somebody because I think they're distractions and you really can uh, take a look at these longer term projects. So I will leave you with a call to action to your work. Can you take your, your own goals for training and ask yourselves who needs, not wants, who needs the work that you're doing? How do you know that you're studying the most valuable question to them? What is the team around you that you need to create to make your work valuable? And how can you deliver your work quickly to deliver better value? You should focus on the metrics that matter to you because when I started measuring the metrics I care about, all the other ones took care of themselves. 
So I leave it here. Um, apologies for uh, getting a little quick at the end there, but uh, my contact info is there. And again, if my experiences of creating technologies and getting it out to market can help you or you're interested and just wanting to know like, how do I do this? I want to do more of it. I'm happy to follow up and set up a Zoom meeting. Um, I do this every Friday with people all over, the, all, over the, all over North America. So with that, I thank you so much for your time and this opportunity. Thank you, Ben. Uh, it was awesome. <laughs> it was a really nice presentation. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, in case uh, anybody has a question, feel free to either raise your hand or uh, uh, type it in the chat. And I have a couple of questions to ask you, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, sure. Go ahead. This is just uh, a word cloud that was created from everybody's comments. I said I'd create and send it out there. So these are some of the things. I like the word improvement here and learn. So the, 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 those are really cool. I would point out that time and performance are tend to be easier things to measure. And so I want us to, I mean, we want to make sure we, we balance the stuff, right? Because we have to be able to measure it, but we also want to push ourselves to think about improvement. I love that word. But yes, Christos, please. Um, so my, my question are mainly uh, for the virtual humans part, because I'm also working a bit with virtual humans. So uh, why uh, to use virtual humans and not just a chatbot? Or uh, with other words, uh, how important it is to provide some body to the AI that is behind all this? Well, great question, Christos. I mean, so I think the question is, well, you could have just had a chatbot for certain scenarios, right? And I think the thinking is, we wanted to work on scenarios that it mattered. A lot of the observational skills mattered. So that's why the medical field, for example, they really care not only what words you say. So if somebody were to ask you, like when you go to the doctor and they say, well, uh, how, many, how many alcoholic drinks do you drink? Uh, you know, do you drink? And they say, yes. Well, how often? Like, oh, not that often. And how often, how much you drink? Like two? Now, now you saw the way I answered and that all these things were observational of the, the way I was standing was I kind of crossed my fan. All, and so we wanted to work with a scenario that required seeing the body. And so that's what I, I think you're absolutely right. You want to fit and mesh the technology with what's needed, not what was cool or wanted, but is, is needed. So that's why this scenario that we're looking at did require observational skills of how the character is responding, all the social cues that come with it, in addition to just the content alone. Okay, thank, uh, I see Pablo uh, wants to ask a question. So Hi, Pablo. Pablo. Hello, Ben, nice to see you. Um, what are you missing from uh, HMDs or this type of technology yeah. for the type of training that you are doing? That, that's a great question, because I think a lot of people, when they see the virtual characters on a the screen, they're like, oh, that's not VR. Like, well, um, if, what I would say, I'll tell them, I was like, well, we have transcripts where people have been talking with the characters for two, three hours straight. Uh, where do you think they were when they, in, in those two to three hours? Do you think that they were engaged with this character and they really want to know more about this character? Yeah, so isn't that what virtual reality is about? And so for me, I've really moved away from a technical definition of for VR to count as VR, you must have head tracking, you must have, inter you know, Again, I, I, I used to teach it that way. I used to teach my VR course that way. Like, oh, for DS3 eyes or whatever, these interact, you know, it has to have, like there's a bare minimum. And now I look at, well, what in VR, what's our goal? Our goal is to create a virtual reality so that people react in a certain way, right? So that, that I mean, that's most of the ones that I think about, especially in training, the reason why we create this environment so that we can, people can train and learn some. I want to move to the minimum technology required to actually realize that training. I, I know if I had infinite money, I could go buy and spend and build something unbelievable. And don't get me wrong, you might get a 5% you know, improvement, but I'm much more interested now in finding what's the lowest bar that you would need to clear from technology because that tends to be able to allow you to reach more people. And again, I, 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 pointing out to virtual characters by moving to a laptop, we, we actually can get to now, again, almost every person in North America, their health is, has been improved. We know that from scientific studies, their health has been improved by people getting trained by virtual characters. And we can do that because we lowered the technology bar, but we still kept the, the interaction, right? People are still talking to these characters. I mean, the, the, the record is nine hours. You actually have a character, somebody that talked to the character for nine hours and 
con and you have timestamps. So it's not just like they left the computer and then come back. It, it, we actually saw that. So to me, I think it's very much about trying to find out for a scenario, what you're trying to train, what is the minimum that you really need and uh, whatever that bar is. I, it, lucky for you, if it's as low as can be, you know, I, because it just reduces the development cost. I know it makes it harder to get it published. I mean, we've had papers rejected because people say this isn't VR enough. Which I think is that drives me nuts. <laughs> but I so so for me, I, it's just a different way to look at it. Especially if you want to get things in as many people's hands as possible, I look much more at the outcome, the improvement, the learning that happens, as opposed to some technological definition, which I think can be distracting. Well, I, I think I agree with you. The, the only issues that may be uh, we are missing the point on developing this technology, and and probably what we are still missing what, uh, is the the, the killing application for head-mounted displays or for this type of, of uh, devices. And it seems that you don't need it. And, uh, and I'm glad that you don't need it, but, um, but I don't know if you have found uh, two or three examples where this type of uh, immersion could be important. Yeah, I, I think it's very specialized. If you look at the team training scenario that I, that I showed, which had people talking to those virtual characters, that wasn't an actual operating room that they were getting trained in. And it was actually important for them to see the, the materials that they commonly work with in the environment that they con con currently, uh, they work with, they just were tra getting trained in that space. We did see some value there to have these life-size virtual characters within that space that they're gonna be actually physically operating in. So I think that that might be an opportunity for MR, XR type benefits. Again, if the environment that you're training in needs to be this actual environment that you are gonna be operating in, I think that if you found scenarios where that really matters, I think that, that that's an example of a place where um, the, the, the increased cost and in logistics is worth it to you. Great, thank you, Ben. Nice to see you too. Uh, we don't have much time, but I'd like to ask you one more question. Uh, and uh, if you have a short answer, I would really appreciate it. So my question is, how important is the communication believability between the humans and the virtual humans? Because um, there is some sort of communication. So if it's not believable, then this might, suppose, yeah. affect the training. You, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, virtual characters are not currently capable of having just some off the wall conversation, right? So, and nobody's confused that the character is not real, right? I mean, like this is not like, uh, is this, this is clearly a virtual character. So I think to me, again, it's so important for you to spend a lot of time really understanding and talking to your users and understanding like, what is the bare minimum for them to play along, right? And maybe, and can technology get you there? Because if it can't get you there, then you move on to another problem. That's why I go back to that fail fast. So you, you're absolutely right that we chose a scenario, training nurses, for example, that's actually behind the scenes, very structured in how they go about doing their work. They don't talk about anything under the sun. They have a very set path they're trying to train people to go through. There are best practices, there are frameworks. And we leverage those frameworks into the software. And so we said, hey, listen, you, you can't ask the character about, well, what do you think about the IEEE VR conference? Because nobody anticipated that, right? So we didn't put in the answers to that question. But then from a training perspective, knowing that answer doesn't increase training. So I would use training as your North Star and say, hey, with these virtual characters, because somebody will invariably, they call it, uh, they'll try to stump the character. They'll try to ask it something really good. Like, do you have a boyfriend? Or, well, that one's actually medically a correct one. But I mean, they might ask you something really stupid. Hey, will you go out with me? Like we see that with the first character. It's really dumb. But you, one thing you can say is you can use the frameworks of the training and say, listen, our goal is to train these skills. These are the frameworks we're doing it. Because the, the system can't do that, it's okay because you're not, you're not reducing training. That's why, again, focusing on the, on the outcomes, the behaviors and the outcomes you want people to be able to, uh, to support and, and narrowing it down, making sure that it can support that and making sure you've got alignment between the technology and the training needs. That's, I think, the, the critical piece. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, yeah. I really like it. <laughs> uh, so I think that uh, we should move to the next uh, part of the uh, today's workshop, which is the uh, main paper session. So, uh, okay. Brian, uh, 
Okay, so we were scheduled to take a break, but we're a little behind schedule. So we're gonna skip that break. If you need to excuse yourself, feel free to, to do so. Um, for this part of the, the um, workshop, um, we have video presentations from all of our authors. So um, I'm going to basically just jump into the videos. After each video, we'll have a couple minutes to take Q&A um, and uh, hopefully most of the authors are here. So uh, to try to get back on track, let me go ahead and share my screen here with sound. And here's the first video. Hello, my name is Carlos Cortez. I'm a PhD student from the Technical University of Madrid, and I'm here to present a paper, Qualitative Experience Study of Natural Interaction in Extended Reality Environment for Immersive Training. First of all, I will start with an introduction about immersive learning in XR environments. After that, I will explain uh, the XR natural interaction setup with the uh, descri description of the use case task and how we build the, the construction use case. Um, finally, I will present the quality of experience that we addressed and its conclusion and future work. Now I will disappear so you can focus on the presentation. Virtual reality and immersive equipment have gained popularity for industrial training environments. This is because they allow us to reproduce situations saving cost and danger. Moreover, extended reality enables interaction with the local reality by mixing the real and the virtual world. This opens opportunities for immersive learning as the users can interact with elements of their local reality like their hands, tools and augmented objects. While devices exist to integrate hands in extended reality, most of them rely on invasive devices as haptic globes or controllers, and this can lead to a disruption of the immersion. To overcome this issue, we propose a natural interface method. In this paper, we present an industrial learning environment with natural interaction and realistic avatar representation. In addition, a qualitative experience experiment has been carried out by expert people to validate the use case in terms of immersion, cyber sickness, and interactivity. The script of the construction use case consists of a step-by-step -step tutorial in which the user must review visually and through metal measurements a construction reproduced in virtual reality. Extended reality requires the creation and coordination of local and virtual realities, as well as real-time integration of user and interactive objects. So our natural interaction XR setups contains uh, the creation of a virtual world, the creation of a local reality setup, and also how we embed the user and interactive objects through segment color segmentation. For building the virtual world, we used a real 360 picture render on a virtual sphere. The field of the environment also uses realistic texture to keep the realism. On the other hand, the local reality has been built by coordinating 3D model objects with the real ones. But to coordinate the local and the virtual reality, we need to place those 3D models in the same place as the real ones. For this purpose, we developed a wall calibration scene. These calibration scenes allow us to place virtual objects in real space. In order to correctly position virtual objects, the calibration scenes allow us switching between extended and augmented reality. Here is a video, an example video. Oh. And in order to be able to interact in a real time uh, and in a natural way, it is necessary to introduce the local reality into the extended one. In our case, we use the front facing cameras of the HMD that these cameras capture the local reality and bring it into the virtual reality. Afterwards, 
color-based processing is performed, this chroma key, to segment the hands and interactive objects. Um, finally, here is an example of the entire task. The user is starting the virtual wall. I see the floating text explaining the situation. Then the user enters into a special area for changing the floating text. Then the user goes to the coordinated 3D model of the table and read the design document. Then the user verify that the material for for reconstruct the handhold is the correct according to the design document. And then using this measuring tape, he verifies the width of the handhold too. Measuring immersion is key to assessing how natural interfaces affect the quality of experience. Consequently, we decide to assess the user's immersion for validating the learning environment. During the experiment, 14 expert subjects performed the experience. After that, they had to perform a subjective questionnaire evaluating quality of experience factors. These quality of experience factors were the sense of presence, the visual quality, the simulator sickness, the global quality of experience, and their usefulness for training purposes. Here we can observe the results of the questionnaires with 95% confidence intervals. On the left, the three presence factors covering the studio show similar high scores. These values are similar also to previous studies for the same measurements. For the visual quality on the right, we can see that most of them report as good quality. There is only an exception, which is the measuring tape that the score worse than the others. Here are the results for the global quality of experience and the usefulness for training purposes of this tool. Here we can observe that the most users report that the quality of experience was good or better and none of them rated as poor or worse. Also, most users also found the method to be useful as a training method. The result shows that the measurement of the presence and overall quality uh, were reported as good and had a good acceptance. Although the visual quality of most of the object scored well, the measuring tape which was integrated by segmentation, scored worse than the rest. This, is, this was caused because of the camera resolution that wasn't good enough for representing the, the numbers of the measuring tape. As a conclusion on future work, our results suggest that the system can be used for training of workers, particularly supervisors, uh, in the context of construction, also that the system need for some improvement in the visual quality of complex segmented objects like the measuring tape, and also that further research is needed to validate the, this technology with more users and more scenarios. So thank you for the attention, and now you can ask me whatever you want about the paper. Thank you very much. OK, so let's see. Do we have any questions? Um, I don't see any in Discord or in Zoom. So uh, Carlos, I, I believe you're here. So I, I will ask you a question. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, actually, uh, I take that back. Pablo just chimed in. Um, how long uh, were subjects using your software? Uh, about five, seven minutes. Because they, they had to enter into the virtual world with playing, okay, you are in a field, you are here for learning how to review a, a scar and a handhold in a, in a field, 
we explain that they should go to the table, uh, they familiarize with the, with the tools, and after that, they start the experience. And uh, you checked how much they retained later? Did, did you do any type of retention or knowledge testing? Not yet, because uh, we, uh, as you have just point, uh, we need more users and we need uh, longer experiences. And having perhaps another control group or people that are just watching a PowerPoint because the, the alternative of this, in the case of the, of the business, of this business in Nokia, uh the you are facing a your you are facing a powerpoint okay the there we have mm -hmm. to open powerpoint and xr so. <laughs> so then playing off of uh ben's uh keynote what type of metrics do you think you would use in in these future studies what what type of um measurements would you be looking at uh, I think that uh, in the field of the quality of experience, there are several questionnaires uh, about presence, about immersion, usefulness, and there is a need uh, of, I think that we should uh, like uh, go through major studies in order to standardize some of them because uh, we are a community using a lot of different persons, questionnaires and immersive questionnaires. And we are measuring through many, many ways these factors. And I think we should <laughs> take a while for, for the standardizing. <clears throat> so are you uh, uh, only interested in quality of experience? Or are you also um, you know, looking at things like skills transfer, maybe actually transferring the skills from the VR training to a real world task? Mm, I, I, uh, I cannot manage that that because I am from the I'm a PhD student from the university and sure. that is a matter of the of the company. Gotcha. <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's not in my hands. <laughs> okay, sounds very good. Well, thank you very much for your time. Um, I think for sake of time, we will go ahead and move on to the next video. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Swavek, and today I'm going to introduce our paper entitled MICE, a cross-platform mobile AR system for remote collaborative instruction installation support using digital twins. So as the name uh, states, uh, the system is cross-platform in the sense that um, it can be used by both uh, Android powered devices, as you can see on the right uh, hand side, as well as um, iOS users. Uh, in this case, you can see the iPad used by the um, user on the left. And it is skills based systems. In this particular case, we used Azure and we use the cloud to exchange um, data between the users. So what you can see here is the user manipulating the model and uh, in A and in the figure B, um, the user on the left is uploading a new a new model and whenever the user is uh, manipulating this model this is immediately visible on the screen on the other user and vice versa and we can have thanks to the cloud as many users as we want to working simultaneously so first we capture the requirements of our system using uh, something that is called uh, functionalized system technique or fast, fast for short, which is an uh, engineering design methodology that allows us to find and capture the necessary functionality for a given systems without producing the solutions. So in this case, uh, we observe two main tasks. First one is showing digital twin uh, or 3D model, as we understand digital twin in this context, and communicate the instruction. And then when you move from top to bottom and from left to right, um, you are giving more uh, details by answering the question, how we're going to do it. So what you can see here is uh, a 3D model, a digital twin of an existing asset, engineering asset. Uh, of course, digital twin is a way bigger concept with data streaming, with um, uncertainty quantification, predictive maintenance, etc. Um, and all of this data and this components of digital twins are not necessary in our case. Um, where we are working with remote installation and instruction. And so we only focused on using uh, appropriate 3D model with uh, high enough fidelity levels. So it's uh, feasible for providing instructions to the 
um, to the trainees during the um, instruction process. So we observed the four main, four key elements of our system. Uh, first one is the users. Um, so you can see them on both on the left and on the right on this plot. Um, we have two types of users. Uh, basically, they have the same um, functionality and access to the same functionality, but uh, the instruction is able to take over whenever needed. Um, so those users interact with our systems using uh, a set of gestures, typical gestures for touchscreen devices. Those can be tablets or, um, or smartphones. Um, and they collaborate having two views, uh, particularly the shared view. So whenever they manipulate the model in the shared view, um, it is visible instantaneously to any other user at the same time. And they are also able to work locally on the local view, on the local devices, and whatever changes they make in the local or shared view, uh, they're able to exchange those uh, between the views as well. So what's possible? Uh, so uh, what you can see in A and B are um, our logging pages, and then you have um, in C and D user rescaling the model using uh, two fingers the same way you would uh, zoom in or zoom out on the touch screen of devices. Um, then in A and B user is able to rotate the model again using two fingers. One of the fingers will become an axis of rotation and by simply dragging the object on the screen we can change its position. Uh, finally, we can also uh, disassemble the model, as you can see on the D on the far right. Um, if the model is multiplied, the user is able to, uh, by choosing the mode uh, on the menu, the user is able to uh, disassemble it um, and then um, manipulate each of the parts separately. Uh, the user is also, as you can see in B, um, is able to draw on top of the model choosing one of the RGB. Uh, colors. Um, there's a, if you look at the menu, the user is able to um, recenter the model in the user sphere of view, as you can see the, the button on the um, left, on top left the menu, then the user is able to take control over the shared screen, copy to and from shared screen, or engage in the voice uh, conversation with other, um, other users. And what you can see in the bottom menu is undo, um, drawing menu, um, possibility to put a marker on top of the um, of the model in the form of a disappearing arrow, and then choose also the mode allowing the user to disassemble the object. Uh, so we have some uh, preliminary results, findings, and observations for whoever is going to work on such systems. Um, so first, we should over the model with, uh, and especially parts with uh, tags. Uh, which we didn't do in this particular case. Uh, we also remarked that recentering the model uh, in the user's fields of view should be need to have um, functionality of such a system. Um, this is to do many reasons, um, but sometimes the track um, tracking of the object is being lost, and we should be able to provide this to users. And then, of course, there's a range of benefits for using cloud services. Uh, so, for instance, we can offload certain resource intensive operations into the cloud, such as rendering. Uh, we can store the large 3D models in the cloud instead of the um, mobile memory. We can easily update the entire set of the models or the model itself. And um, of course, we can um, collect any metadata and analyze it uh, to provide the users with more. Um, with better UX and more personalized experience overall. So thank you. Okay, um, so I think that's the end of the talk. Um, it doesn't seem like we have any questions on Discord or Zoom, but I do believe our author is here, correct? Yes? Yes. Hi. Yes. Hi, how are you? Um, I'm fine, so how are you? Good, good. So I, I've got a question for you. So um, it seems like you have a pretty nice platform, but do you have any particular use cases, uh, training use cases in mind that, that this platform would, would immediately help with? Yeah, so uh, this was developed um, together with Bosch uh, as our partner. And this particular model that you saw, there's a heat pump, and they actually are teaching um, people installation of this 
um, or similar heat pumps. Um, so this is like of the bad um, use case. Uh, but we also spoke with um, companies that were working towards um, robotization or automatization of uh, production process, and they were also interesting. Uh, in this type of help instruction, but also doing uh, actual servicing, uh, especially if the expert is uh, not at the fabric at the moment and some technician has to go and do the work. So I didn't I, I didn't catch in your talk. Um, does your your system support voice communications? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Great. Um, let's see. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, yes. Uh, do race conditions become an issue when multiple users are modifying the same object, or is this already being handled? <clears throat> well, this is very much proof of concept. Uh, okay. So we did not test in this direction. So I have no answer here. Sorry. OK. Good, good question, though. Yeah. Um, OK, well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to the next talk. Hello, everyone. I'm going to present a paper simulating wind tower construction process for virtual construction safety training and active learning. As one power source alternative to fossil fuels, wind energy is heavily demanded all over the world. Therefore, how to construct wind tower in a timely manner and cost-saving manner becomes a popular topic for the wind tower industry. As one key observation is that lots of time and cost overruns are caused by construction safety issues. Construction workers must be trained effectively with respect to safety of violence in the job site. For addressing such a problem, we develop a VR training program aiming at informing workers of these vital options uh, for ensuring job site safety and testing and awareness of construction safety through realistic simulation of the wind tower construction process in an immersive virtual reality environment. We, we simulate the uh, the virtual. We simulate the wind tower construction process using a mathematical procedural animation method. During each stage, we apply the robotic dynamics calculations to each moving part of the construction tools. For simplifying the implementations. We use different grammars to represent the procedural animations. This section illustrates the mathematics behind our simulation approach. So this video shows the full the full video of the with tower construction process simulated with our approach.
This is another video. Thanks for watching. Okay, great. Um, so I think the author is here. Real quick comment, um, uh, because the Discord notifications were coming through and I don't know how to quickly disable those, I have to shut down Discord. So if you do have any questions, please deliver those through the Zoom chat, um, just to simplify things and make it easy on your moderator. Um, for the time being, I, I, I do have a, a few questions about the about the, um, the training that you presented. So it seemed like there was a lot of knowledge-based questions I was trying to capture or, or, or pay attention to the video, but was the information pertaining to the knowledge questions um, kind of in those informational prompts that would pop up directly beforehand, or was it more kind of like the user had to kind of use intuition and really pay attention to the animation to determine what the correct answer was? Hey, hi, hello, hello, Professor. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thanks for your question. And uh, actually, uh, there is uh, uh, actually we are, uh, we have a we have a team that uh, uh, working on this. So it's like there are lots of uh, uh, very professional uh, uh, aspects about uh, construction safety uh, knowledge. Uh, therefore, if the uh, if the user has no uh, background on the construction uh, safety knowledge. Uh, actually, uh, they, they are not able to uh, to be tr uh, trained very well. But uh, uh, in general, if you <clears throat> don't have such background through the uh, 3D animation, you at least uh, uh, learn something. But uh, if you want to really answer the question, you really uh, need to have some background. I see. So, so the training is more meant for kind of refresher training for people who are already knowledgeable with the area, as opposed to like initial initial learning or initial training. Oh, uh, yes, yes. Gotcha. Excellent. And then um, you mentioned this professional team that you guys were working with. I, I assume that this is a professional team of subject matter experts. Um, out of curiosity, did they help you craft your knowledge questions? Uh, yes, uh, should be. Yeah. Gotcha. Excellent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, does anyone else have a question for, for uh, when, when? Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. And we'll go ahead and move on to the next talk. Hello, everyone. My name is Saif Hassati, and today I will present my work about a new model for cognitive IVT based on IVT for critical safety solution for firefighter use case. So this is the outline of our presentation. First, we will have a look about the context and motivation, then our like IVT resource and smart IVT model, then the application of our model in the firefighter use case, besides like an evaluation and discussion. Finally, a conclusion and perspective. So let's move to the context and motivation. Uh, even though several uh, models have been existing for decades, it's still not sure which model to use. So we have to create a new model that can answer on different uh, requests, like which IVT hardware to select, how to design a useful training based on IVT technology, how to create a realistic scenario, and what are the required requirements for designing an effective VTL training. So for that, we had to design a smart IVT model based on usability, which has like three metrics, satisfaction, effectiveness, and efficiency, in order to answer on different uh, requirements like which IVT hardware and different factors and the main context of the application. So let's move to an investigation on IVT resource and the smart IVT model. Uh, first of all, we had to classify the IVT resource based on uh, different metric like different sensors, IVT software, and factors, which are individual factors, technological factors, and operational factors. These factors was in collaboration with uh, the Department of Psychology in NTANU, and they are based on different metrics like field of view, screen, portability, recognition of like real object, and the trapping for each device. Then let's have a look about the smart IVT model, which is uh, defined the seamless integration between the 
immersive environment with intelligence. And here we have like three uh, layers, which is like the per perception layer based on the different sensor, camera, LCD, the decision making and processing layer that can be divided in the cognitive smart IVT into two, uh, two layers. And finally, the service layer that gave us our smart and immersive application. So what is cognitive smart IVT? Cognitive Smart IVT is the mesh of cognitive immersive technology with collected data from headset or controller of connected immersive devices. And in order to create uh, a sophisticated uh, uh, training uh, based on adequate uh, technology, we, our contribution will be based on self-adaptivity that contains four phases. The first phase is monitoring by defining different models uh, for training based on IVT technology. Then we try to analyze the different uh, training process and the related factors that we already uh, investigate in the related work section. Then we will try to evaluate these factors besides we have like in the analyzing phase, then we will pass to the deciding phase in order to match these factors by technology and choose the right data visualization engine and data analyzation and analytics uh, techniques. This can help us to move to executing phase in order to design a new serious training based on IBT technology. So let's apply this model in the firefighter use case. So in this, we had like uh, to make uh, a training based on the firefighter requirement. So this work was in collaboration with the Institute National Italian for Firefighter. And we had to extract the different requirements of the firefight real firefighters. Uh, they suggest uh, earthquake scenario and in the monitoring phase we had to use just only two sensors which is accelerometer sensor and gyroscope sensors and this can help us to choose a fully uh, artificial environment which is virtual reality and not augmented reality the, and we don't need object recognition or portability for the device so we just so uh, the firefighter decide that HTC Vive would be the adequate design for this training uh, in order to achieve uh, different factors like experience of realism, simulator sickness, and body experience. And then uh, we could, and finally we could uh, execute the smart immersive training for firefighter based on VR technology. So the use of an earthquake situation was proposed as Italian firefighter, and we had to design the same the, the same environment uh, uh, and has to be realistic as possible as can. Uh, and we have like uh, to perform the same task that uh, the firefighter suggest in earthquake situation. Um, then we evaluate this work by. Uh, by uh, having an experiment, so two groups of firefighters should enter a basement after earthquake and perform a specific task. Before performing the task, the operator must be trained two types of training for this task with the pilot. One based on paper instruction and the second one based on the art. Uh, and both of tasks had like 15 minutes and then like the uh, most of, sorry, most of training have 15 minutes and then they have to perform the same task in the real basement that they were training on. So all participants were administered a usability questionnaire, like in order to check the efficiency, effectiveness, and satisfaction for the application based on different scale. And we extract the like we evaluated the result based on standard deviation for different uh, like a uh, task and also like for percentage like for successful completion for the usability of the application and the time-based efficiency for every task 
and here we have like two conflicts that we we solved the first conflict is the heterogeneity conflict that uh, it is related to the diversity of user IVT technology and the second one is the factor matching problem that is used for selecting the adequate technology uh, based on the requirement of the stakeholder which can be different metrics so in this context we can like deduce that our uh, smart IVT model uh, based on self adaptivity can overcome the problem with this various conflicts and manage the design of serious training based on smart IVT technology. So in the conclusion and perspective, uh, in this paper we have discussed like different emerging IVT technology devices and sensor. We also like defined the basic concept of cognitive IVT layers and architecture models. Then we have created a new model for cognitive IVT based on IVT uh, and that can be used in different critical safety scenarios. And the proposed model based on self-adaptivity was used for firefighter training use case. Well, sorry, validate, not just use it, and in firefighter use case. And in the future, we will use augmented reality uh, for another scenario. Thank you very much for your attention. OK, great. Um, I believe our author is here. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, yes. Great. Um, so first, uh, any questions from the audience? Again, if, if you do have a question, do please put it in the Zoom chat um, just to make things a little bit easier. But while we wait to see if the audience has any questions, um, I, I was curious, um, you're, you're, you <clears throat> reviewed your results pretty quickly about the paper versus the VR conditions. Could you just talk a little bit more about those results and, and what the outcomes were? Uh, uh, the results show that the use of uh, this model can enhance uh, the selection of the technology that are adequate for the scenario. So the training of firefighter using VR, like uh, the device of HTC Vive, uh, show better result than uh, the the people uh, the firefighters who were, who were the training on um, papers. So somehow this validate uh, the model that we propose. Can you talk a little bit more about the the details of those results? So so I assume based off of your methodology, you found that. Um, uh, individuals in the VR condition or who trained in the VR condition were able to complete more tasks in the real yes. world. Is that correct? Okay. Yes. Uh, firefighters who were training on uh, virtual reality has better results. Like for example, they, they uh, because you had two groups of firefighters, one group were training on papers and the other group were training on, on virtual reality. Then both of groups uh, go to the real basement and they had this uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the same task that they were training on in on papers or on virtual reality they had to perform so uh, 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 we try to measure like the the three metrics of usability which is like uh, efficiency effectiveness and satisfaction based on the time the completion of task and uh, also uh, like the different factors, like sickness, things like that. And the results show like the user of VR uh, were, uh, had better results than the user of uh, papers. So. Great, excellent. Well, thank you very much for presenting your paper and we'll go ahead and uh, move on to the next talk. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the presentation of AR Hero, generating interactive augmented reality guitar tutorials. My name is Lukas Iberu Skreinig from Graz University of Technology, and this is a collaborative effort with the University of Stuttgart. The guitar is one of the most popular instruments to learn, and there is a great deal of content on the internet for beginners to start learning guitar basics. For complete newcomers, however, these can prove to have high barriers of entry. Reading notes or guitar tablature requires study and practice, and finer details of basic techniques can be lost when using video lessons, for example. We present a system 
which utilizes an augmented reality approach for assisting beginners with these challenges, while addressing the shortcomings of related work. Several hardware and software solutions exist which attempt to tackle this problem. These often fall short when it comes to handling user input, integrating the visualization with the instrument, or generating lesson content. In the following, I will detail how our system addresses these issues. The main difficulty with traditional self-teaching methods lies in the learner's need to transform abstract notations to actions on the instrument. Augmented reality techniques can overcome this problem by embedding the learning material within the instrument itself. We implement two separate AR scenarios from which the user can choose. Our desktop-based setup is similar to a magic mirror, where the augmented content and the view from the cameras is visible on a monitor. We rigidly attach two webcams to the guitar, one with a view of the fretboard, one looking at the bridge. By displaying these images side by side, we simulate a panoramic view of the guitar with the strings and frets clearly visible. Highlighting colored markers superimposed onto the guitar neck communicates to the user where to place their fingers. Similarly, we highlight the strings to communicate to the user when to pluck which string. As this method cannot convey details such as the intended finger pose, we additionally implement a method which displays an animated virtual hand for the user to mimic. Applying a custom semi-transparent shader makes the contours of each finger more visible, while still letting the users see the real fretboard and their own hand. In addition, the traditional guitar tablature is still visible to the user though it is not necessary for understanding the content. As an alternative to the desktop-based setup, a visual see-through head-mounted display integrates the lesson into the user's natural view. The guitar is tracked with an HTC Vive tracker. One of the major advantages of learning guitar is the abundance of online content available, such as on the popular website Ultimate Guitar. Allowing users to convert text-based tablature into an interactive lesson makes additional content easy to produce for our system, though some adjustments need to be made. The result is a lightweight, human-readable text file which our system parses into an interactive tutorial. The notes plucked by a user are captured by a MIDI interface and passed to the PC via USB. This allows a variety of playback options, such as a responsive mode where every beat is halted until the user plays the correct notes, effectively adjusting the content to the pace of the user. This also allows the system to interpret the user's performance and provide error feedback if necessary. The instant feedback is designed to save the user the time commonly spent searching for and correcting their mistakes. The 3D virtual hand communicates the shape and position of each finger, however it is still only an abstraction of the teacher's intention. Alternative to interpreting generated lessons by parsing tablature, we can record and play back actual performances in 3D. We attach a camera rig consisting of six cameras to the guitar's headstock, which send their video streams to a computer over USB. The images are fed frame by frame into a light field reconstruction algorithm. The result is a stack of image layers that accurately conveys scene depth 
and allows us to view the content from novel viewpoints by virtually projecting selected planes into the scene and switching the images frame by frame we can achieve a free viewpoint video representation we intend to improve our image capturing setup which should produce higher quality multiplanar images which are more viable for ar integration in addition we intend to perform a user study to determine the effectiveness of the proposed guidance methods when compared to traditional methods of self-learning. In summary, AR Hero is a guitar practicing system aimed at beginners with an expandable library of easy to generate lessons and multiple methods of display and visualization. Thank you for your attention. Okay, great. Uh, do you believe our author Lucas is here? Is that correct? Yes, hi. Hi, how are you? I'm great. Good. Um, let's see, I don't see any questions in Zoom, so I, I do have a question for you. You say that you're going to, you're planning to conduct a user study. Do you have any preliminary hypotheses on, um, for example, is VR better than desktop? And also with regard to the desktop one, um, is the additional kind of hand uh, visualization, you know, uh, beneficial or is it kind of cognitive overload considering the amount of information shown? Thank you for the question. Uh, we do have some, some hypotheses specifically taken from also related work, which have done user studies in the past. Uh, and these are also, and every one you mentioned is a question we want to tackle. Basically, in general, is it uh, comparable to using traditional methods of self-teaching, self this uh, VR situation? And if so, which method is superior? Do you have any hy hypothesis on which method is of, of yours is going to be better because you have the two, the desktop base and the, the headset base? We have uh, some data that says that the three-dimensional hands can provide an easier, since it is less of an abstraction, so to speak, than the totally abstract points on the guitar. It can be easier, but uh, we aren't sure. But this is a hypothesis of ours. Great. And I see uh, Paulo, I, I believe you have a question. Yes. Uh, thank you, Lucas, for your presentation. And um, we did a, a, a simpler implementation some years ago with the HoloLens uh, that is uh, see-through, as you know. Um, yes. What do you think? What do you think it will be better uh, with a better technology of uh, see-through environments instead of uh, the approach that you have taken with the Vive? Thank you for the question. Um, I'll have, I'll, I'll, I don't know if you tried the, the HoloLens for your implementation. Um, what did you we, think as your comments uh, from that? Originally, we did intend to use the HoloLens and we even uh, have tried uh, like porting the system to the HoloLens and seeing how it performs. However, we did find that uh, the HoloLens's narrow field of view made it quite difficult to see uh, the intended, when you're holding a guitar, you have to look at your hand, which can be in the periphery of your vision. And the HoloLens only has a very narrow field of possibilities yeah. for augmentation in the center of the screen, which made, I mean, me when I tried it, made me crane my neck, which became very uncomfortable after a short time. Yes, uh, well, uh, I, I copied uh, the, the URL in, in, in Discord if you want to check later on, but uh, we used uh, oh, some markers uh, in the field of view of the of the HoloLens in order to to do similar things, but uh, I, I agree did reference you. your paper. <laughs> I have I yeah. yeah. Okay, I, I didn't check. Sorry. <laughs> oh, thank you. This is you know, we, and I do think that you also mentioned some user fatigue at the in user studies. Yes, uh, but the but the HoloLens one, the field of view of the HoloLens ones is more challenging than the two. Uh, so I have to try now, but uh, but I think it's, it's better now. Okay, and then I'm going to combine kind of two questions. There, there's uh, one question about finger tracking and one question about registering the guitar frets. Could you just talk about kind of uh, <clears throat> expand upon your tracking, basically how, how you're doing registration and tracking? Yeah, thank you. Uh, for the Magic Mirror, Set up the desktop based setup. Uh, since the cameras are rigidly attached to the guitar, they only have to be tracked once, is the idea basically. 
So that's done currently by uh, just selecting predetermined markers or like virtual markers on the guitar, uh, which we can then use uh, PNP solver just for placing the virtual content in the in the camera's view. Uh, as for fingers, the finger tracking is basically done by the the MIDI pickup which we use, which can tell which note is being played on which string. So that kind of does it for us. Great, excellent. Of well, course, thank you not very. Which finger is placed is is actually on the string, yeah, right? Exactly. Just which yeah. one gets, yeah. Just which yeah. string is placed where. Yeah. Right. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for the the excellent presentation, sure. and for sake of time, we'll move on to the next talk. Hi, everyone. My name is Shahin Duridi. I'm currently a PhD student in the Department of Computer Science, University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Today, I'm going to present our work on real-time information of user behaviors during search and rescue training of firefighters, known as SAR. As we all know, training certain types of professions like firefighting is costly, and creating an actual scene where firefighters can face lifelike situations is nearly impossible. What we have presented here in this paper is using virtual reality devices to create an atmosphere to experience various dangerous situations, improve decision making, and evaluate the impact of new stimulus in training of firefighters. Since the focus of our study is real-time information for SAR tasks under dangerous situations, we have designed our experiment for participants to experience and perform the SAR tasks with fires and smokes inside residential buildings. With a VR simulation system, we recorded details of changes from both the environment and participants, including motions of their heads, hands, and bodies, so that we can further measure several types of user behaviors and explore their decision-making process. In order to generate fire effects in the scene, we use VFX, multi-level structure that composes different types of basic particle systems. This gives real life fire effects and better performance in higher levels, where lots of fire particles are instantiated inside the house. For the map object, since the internal structure of the buildings are all different in each level, and that's to avoid the possibility of participants remembering the routes, we had to develop a class so the map layout could be automatically generated. We keep the outer layer of the building, but we are changing the inner structure. For our user study, we identified two independent variables, the information available in the virtual map supporting the tasks and the danger degree of the tasks caused by the fires and the smoke. For each variable, we designed three scales with the information level and danger degree increasing gradually. Specifically, the information levels contain a map with just a building shape, a map with only static information, and a map with both static and dynamic information about the fires and persons to be rescued inside the house. The danger degrees covered a baseline for a rel relatively safe situation where participants can still see through the rooms, a medium level, and a challenge situation where participants can hardly see things in distance due to the fire and smoke in the building, simulating real SAR scenes of firefighters. Our results confirm this hypothesis that several types of behaviors, including moving, rotation, interaction, and number of rescued people are all affected by the level of danger of the task. We also show the correlation between several pairs of behaviors, like inverse relationships between completion time with repeated distance and view rotation. Our results also confirm this hypothesis that virtual maps are helpful for SAR tasks. There are statistically significant differences between the number of people rescued and information level or danger level. Our results are consistent with this hypothesis that real-time information is more likely to affect the behaviors of participants during the most dangerous situations. We observe outlier behaviors, such as not completing the SAR task, are more frequent on the most dangerous levels. Our work shows that user behaviors can be captured and analyzed to reflect changes of psychological factors or processes of decision making. Also from our results, we can identify the dependency of SAR performances on the locomotion behaviors. 
Participants with better locomotion records, including large teleportation distances and faster moving speed, generally achieve better performance. Their completion time does not increase by much, and their performance records are much better under dangerous situations than other participants. In order to dig deeper into user decision-making process, in a new version of this platform, we added immersive paths in the scene so that the user can make better decisions on how to navigate and rescue the people inside the house. As you can see, the green path shows the closest person to the user. Also, we added a collaboration feature where two or more users can join into one session in the scene in order to divide the tasks of search and rescue. As you can see on the map, the black marker shows the second player in the scene. We hope with these new features, we can gain a better understanding of user decision-making process in SAR situations like firefighting. Thank you. All right, excellent. Um, I believe our author, uh, Shaheen, you're here, yes? Yes. Great, excellent. Um, I don't see any questions from Zoom, so I, I've got a question for you. Can you um, expand upon the two information levels that you investigated? It sounded like one was real time and one wasn't real time. Is that correct? Or could you just describe those conditions so, a little bit more? Yeah. So we had two parts of um, information provided to the users. One was the real time, which was the map. So the map provided the real time information of the position of the people inside the house and also the level of the fire inside the house. So uh, on the map, the user can see where the fire are inside the house and where the people are positioned. And the other thing is uh, the static part was the fire level in each level. So uh, we had 10 levels of the, let, let's, if we call it a game, there were 10 level of games. So with the first level, the fire and the smoke level were very low. So the user can see and walk easily inside the house and see other people and rescue them. But as we go higher into the level, the amount of the fire and that amount of the uh, smoke in the, into, inside the house uh, gets more and more, and it makes it more difficult for users to navigate through the house. Excellent. Got it. Uh, I believe, Christos, you, you have a question. Yeah, I have a question. So what is the justification of using a map? Because what I'm thinking is that uh, if there is a fire and firefighters come at my home, most likely they are not aware about the building and the structure of the building. So why for, uh, during training, we should give them a map? Mm -hmm. So actually that's the, that's the uh, main part that we are focusing on. So we are trying to provide some uh, added features, some um, um, options to, for, for the firefighters to use it. And here is it's, it's uh, what we call the real time map so there are these sensors that can be uh, uh, installed inside the house where they can uh, position the people inside the house and give you the information of the amount of the fire that is inside the house and also there are uh, tools that can make the plan of the building provided to the firefighters so using all these devices, user uh, firefighters can have these maps that uh, provides them with live information of the fire and the people, and also the structure of the building. So these can be used uh, for firefighters to navigate better and uh, do their better SAR tasks inside the houses. Okay, great. Um, well, first off, I would like to thank all of our authors uh, for, for, for uh, presenting at our workshop. It's, it's been great hearing about all the different uh, training XR applications here. And um, we were supposed to take another break, but we're going to keep chugging right along so that we don't go too far off schedule. Um, I do believe our next keynote, Saab, is here. Um, Saab, are, are, are you here? Uh, yes. Excellent. Can you all see me? Yes, we can. Um, and you, sh you should be a co-host, so you should be able to go ahead and um, start sharing your screen if you want to while I read your bio. Does that sound good to you? Uh, sure. Yes, that sounds great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah.
Yeah, absolutely. So um, just to introduce Saab, he's an associate professor in the Division of Human-Centered Computing in the School of Computing at Clemson uh, University. Uh, he received his BS in 2000, his MS in 2002, and his PhD in 2007 uh, from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. And he completed a postdoctoral fellowship in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Iowa prior to joining Clemson University in 2010. His research interests are in the areas of virtual environments, applied perception in VR and AR, virtual humans and crowds, educational virtual reality, and 3D human computer interaction. He has authored or co-authored over 100 peer-reviewed publications in these areas of research. He was the general chair for the IEEE uh, International Conference on Virtual Reality and 3D User Interfaces, IEEE VR in 2016. He also served as the program chair for IEEE VR 2017. He and his students have received six Best Paper Awards and premier IEEE and ACM research venues, including um, the IEEE VR 2018, <clears throat> uh, IEEE 3D UI 2007 and 2016, ACM uh, SAP uh, 2016 and 2020, uh, and the IEEE International Conference on Healthcare Informatics in 2013, and a Best Presentation Award for ACM SAP in 2021, and several honorable mentions for best papers. His research has been sponsored by the U.S. National Science Foundation, the U.S. Department of Labor, Adobe Research Foundation, St. Francis Hospital Foundation, and Medline Medical Foundation. Uh, so let's thank uh, Saab for, for giving a keynote today. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful introduction. It's really an honor and a privilege to be here. Thank you so much. And it's wonderful to see everyone. I wish I could see everyone in person. It's wonderful to see so many familiar faces here. Uh, thank you for attending my talk. So uh, I co-direct the Virtual Environments Research Group. Uh, just a quick shout out to my team, along with Dr. Andrew Roth. And uh, here are some of our uh, past students, our student alumni, as well as our current members and my collaborators and their students at present. Um, we are a very social group. We work together. We do a lot of demos together. Uh, we conduct a lot of research in the lab. Um, my students and I celebrate important events for one another and so on. And uh, we practice presentations and what have you. Here are some screenshots of my team. So let me jump right in. Uh, the first project that I want to talk about is, uh, so these are projects regarding training and education that I am entirely focusing on uh, that I did once I got to Clemson back in 2010. So it's been 12 years. So, uh, so the, the first project that I got involved in is uh, in preventive epidemiology. My undergraduate degree is in microbiology. So I've always been interested in merging virtual reality with medicine. And so uh, we created the interactive VR simulation back in 20, 2010, 2011 to educate medical practitioners in the CDC's five moments of hand hygiene. And it was the first such simulation of its kind uh, in terms of um, educating users in hand hygiene uh, best practices. Um, so the simulation uses a scaffolded learning process and in, uh, with instruction guided practice and open exercise. The initial work was published in, uh, in EVA in, 20, uh, in 2010. And uh, we also had a follow-up work that was published uh, in SIGHIT uh, later on. So I wanna briefly show a quick video of that simulation dating from that time. It has three phases. It starts off with the tutorial phase where we have a virtual human instructor that uh, teaches you the five moments of hand hygiene. I hope you can hear my video. Uh, no, actually. Welcome to the oh, University yes, yes, of yes, Iowa yes. Hospitals and Clinic. My name is Evan and I'm going to teach you the five moments of hand hygiene. Proper hand hygiene is the number one preventative measure against the spread of infections, but unfortunately it is the most overlooked. This training simulation is designed to help you identify, memorize, and utilize the five moments of hand hygiene. So upon a brief introduction similar to this, this doesn't contain the entire instruction, then participants are randomly presented with some scenarios in which the virtual healthcare worker either comes to or not with regards to the And so the virtual healthcare worker may follow a uh, moment or not, or may violate the moment and then interact with the, with the patient, the virtual patient, in one of these randomly generated scenarios. And uh, the trainee acts as a healthcare inspector observing these scenarios and then has to identify whether it conforms to or violates one of the 
uh, five moments of hand hygiene and which one it is. And towards the end of the simulation, they are provided a score and feedback. So this scaffolded inter, uh, the simple uh, training environment actually worked really well with a lot of the nurses and the healthcare workers. And an initial study actually showed that this, uh, this interactive simulation actually uh, enabled our learners to learn these five moments of hand hygiene and uh, gave them um, a, a, a very good basis for practicing them in their day-to-day -day practice. And then from there, we considered uh, further visualizations on that same project uh, where we were able to work with a distributed sensor network professor uh, at the University of Iowa. And he and I wired uh, a, a ward of the University of Iowa hospital. And so we, we wanted to then uh, measure uh, for instance, and then do an interactive visualization so that hospital administrators could do visual analytics using a VR-based visualization of how often healthcare practitioners were, uh, uh, were practiced uh, in accordance with the five moments of hand hygiene, as well as other epidemiological uh, pra best practices and principles that prevented the spread of infection in a hospital setting. And this all took place during the time of H1N1, so uh, the hospital acquired infections cases of H1N1 were, were highly prevalent. And so this was a very important project at that time. And eerily 10 years later, the same concepts and principles are also important during the current pandemic as well. So here is a visualization of the movements and actions of the virtual healthcare workers entirely created from automatic uh, uh, logs of the, uh, the distributed sensor networks and the surveillance logs. And from there, scenarios were generated automatically for the uh, interact for the virtual healthcare workers and their interactions with the virtual patients. Um, from the sensor distributed sensor logs, we know exactly when virtual healthcare, uh, healthcare workers exited and entered rooms in this ward. And so from there, we were able to recreate their motions. And also within the patient rooms, we were able to recreate their actions as well. So this work was published in ACM SIGHIT in 2012 and was a novel way of, of constructing uh, realistic uh, interactive scenarios from real world data for training and visualization and visual analytics. And, uh, uh, and then we also can leverage this for patient safety training. So we can actually take any portion of the recreation of the distributed sensor log information in this virtual hospital and use it as a simulation test bed for training uh, healthcare workers in patient safety and hand hygiene practices. However, when we did that, we often found that these uh, healthcare workers uh, who were novice healthcare workers often got lost in this hospital ward because this is a very big hospital. So we actually implemented a wayfinding aid in the simulation so that it's a dynamic wayfinding aid that actually would help these healthcare workers perform their tasks. And we showed that these the presence of the wayfinding aid actually helped them uh, perform their tasks uh, accurately and also help them navigate larger spaces within this virtual environment as well. This was uh, published in Eurographics and EuroVR back in 2013. Um, we also did a lot of visual analytics, uh, meaning we also uh, looked at eye tracking data when participants had wayfinding aids versus when they, when they did not in various uh, training situations with the nurses and doctors at the hospital in order to make sure that they did in fact view the patient safety and uh, hand hygiene infringements as part of the simulation for training as well. And so we, uh, uh, in the process, we also noted uh, their uh, visual attention behaviors when there was a wayfinding aid versus when they weren't. And we noticed that participants leveraged these wayfinding aids when they were in corridors in what we call movement space uh, as they went between patient rooms. And when they were in patient rooms, which we call interaction space, they actually viewed the virtual healthcare workers much more often. One of the um, downsides of using wayfinding aids that we noted was similar to uh, how people behave when they're using cell phones in the real world, when they're crossing through busy intersections and on pedestrian walkways. So the wayfinding aids can also distract uh, these users. And so in the presence of wayfinding aids, we noticed that participants relied on them so much as a cognitive prosthetic that they ended up colliding with objects in the environment. They collided with other uh, virtual healthcare workers and things like that. So we found that visual attention behaviors, navigation behaviors were in fact very different in the presence or absence of wayfinding aids in these training simulations. Moving on to another uh, set of projects, 
So I, I then got involved in a five-year project called CAVE, which were where I was part of the establishment of the Center for Aviation and Automotive Technical Education, uh, which was an APE grant that was uh, awarded to Clemson University, among others. And so our job as part of this Good job. was to measure the inside gap. Uh, interactive simulations that was meant to train users, technical uh, uh, te uh, student technicians, in partnering technical colleges in the upstate of South Carolina uh, in aviation automotive technical education, especially in psychomotor skills. And so I started working uh, very heavily on designing interaction design of virtual reality simulations for near field psychomotor skills training, so psychomotor skills acquisition. So we created interactive simulations for, in, for precision metrology learning, such as interactive vert, vernier caliper simulations, bevel gauge depth micrometer, and, and for circuitry relevant concepts as well. The key research questions that really motivated us was does bimanual uh, two-handed manipulation metaphors enhance learning of these psychomotor skills as opposed to traditional interaction metaphors uh, uh, in these uh, types of uh, near field uh, fine motor task learning? And also what are the effects of immersion and uh, interaction fidelity on these psychomotor skills acquisition? So here's an example of um, um, fast forward a couple of years from there, uh, circa 2016. And so here's a student of mine who actually built an advanced simulation in the same project for training um, uh, the student technicians in precision metrology concepts. And so here's a simulation that uh, uh, is on a large screen, uh, is on a large screen 3D display. And we also uh, worked with uh, simulations in which simulation fidelity was altered either gravity was enabled or gravity was disabled. And then we studied how uh, interactions ensued as a result of um, physics fidelity and simulation fidelity being low or high. And uh, so uh, and uh, the uh, student actually takes a measurement using the virtual, uh, the virtual vernier caliper in the screen and he's got to squint and look really hard to read off the vernier caliper measurement and then we actually also created an interaction metaphor using a radial menu to then enter that result. Okay. So here we see the head mounted display based interaction of the same. And here in this case, gravity is enabled. And we see my former PhD student, uh, Dr. Ayush Bhargav, who's taking a measurement of the inner diameter of this object using the vernier caliper. And then again, we are, he's using two handed metaphor and he's actually looking down at his hands as he's performing this task. And the entire simulation scenario is presented in his personal space or his near field. So he has end effector co-location. He's able to leverage his, uh, uh, his stereoscopic viewing, head track motion parallax, and enhance depth presentation within the near field in order to then perform this task. Uh, we also were able to leverage a lot of concepts from the learning sciences, such as scaffolded learning, for example. Um, so that we had a guided practice phase in which the simulation introduced the participant step-by-step step in these uh, psychomotor skill tasks in which participants had to perform a certain step correctly before it allowed them to move on to the next step. Okay. And uh, we also had, for instance, uh, 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 steps in which we, we had learning interactive learning experiences where they could learn these cognitive aspects of how to read the vernier scale but interactively, um, because rather than watching a video in simulation, they needed to be able to use both, uh, have a hands-on sort of uh, learning metaphor for learning how to uh, interpret the Vernier scale, which is one of the challenges in this type of task. So we did, we did lots of studies. Uh, here's a snapshot of one that was published in IEEE VR 2015, in which we looked at how uh, the simulation fidelity, for instance, the interaction fidelity specifically related to that simulation, where on a simpler level, we had three degree of freedom type interaction, a simplistic interaction, versus six degree of freedom, um, full bimanual interaction using all degrees of freedom, affected uh, two dimensions. Uh, the, uh, the precision level of uh, learning the task performance, and also the cognitive aspects of being able to articulate all the steps involved in the task. So the way that we measured this was that after simulation-based training, participants had to work on a real workbench and had to perform the task. And uh, here's a snapshot of the tasks that they're doing in their real workbench. And we would measure their accuracy, effectiveness, uh, and whether they are following all the steps in performing the task and things like that. 
So we found this inter neat interaction effect where uh, the six degree of free freedom interaction metaphor, this bimanual interaction metaphor facilitated the precision aspects of learning these psychomotor skills much more effectively than the, than the simplistic metaphor. Um, however, the simple three degree of freedom metaphor with reduced degrees of freedom in bimanual interaction actually helped in learning the, uh, the steps involved, the cognitive aspects of the task much more effectively as compared to the six, de six degree of freedom interaction metaphor. Uh, there's also the problem of end effector collocation as, and mismatch depending on the uh, viewing metaphor. So we also noticed that uh, through, through several studies, some of which were published in, I, in IEEE 3D UI in 2017, and also a TVCG paper uh, that we published in 2018, also showed that in large screen immersive display viewing conditions, these displays were able to afford better viewing resolution and field of view, but you have this problem of this disconnect between your physical end effectors being in your personal space and your vir virtual end effectors floating in screen space due to the fact that you have this minimal depth plane uh, closer to which you can't present these stereoscopic uh, rendering of your end effectors and objects that you're interacting with because you would have problems focusing and uh, perceiving depth of using your left eye, right eye stereo. So in the process, you have this constant offset between your physical end effectors and your virtual end effectors. And we noticed that this is one aspect that was causing difficulty in participants, especially with regards to near, full psych near field psychomotor task performance and learning. The HMD based viewing, however, affords better perception action coordination and motor control because you have um, uh, enhanced depth presentation, uh, spatial presentation, and perception. You're, of course, also closer to, your, uh, to the objects that you're interacting with, and your, and your end effectors are perfectly co located and you're performing these interactions in your personal space. So that seems to help as well. And so we noticed that uh, the, the HMD condition, although it, it, uh, uh, it shows uh, greater um, uh, eff efficacy of the task performance with regards to near field psychomotor task performance, as compared to say the large screen display metaphor because of the issues that I outlined, but it also came with a cost, which was that the mental demand and performance demand was much higher in the HMD based viewing condition, when you had very good perception action coordination and you're performing these tasks in the personal space as compared to large screen display condition as well. So that seems to be interesting. However, it's, uh, that may be because of greater visual attention to the task and focus on the task, because we also noticed that frustration was much lower in the HMD based condition as compared to the large screen display condition. We also built a lot of uh, other simulations as part of this uh, project to teach a variety of cognitive skills. And here's one physics-based simulation in which uh, participants had to learn the center of gravity and how to push, uh, push back an aircraft. Um, and again, we employed uh, scaffolded learning experiences as part of this task. We also created simulations for manufacturing safety as part of the same project in which uh, my students and I, we uh, using photogrammetry and lots of uh, digital production arts tools we were able to recreate a high fidelity simulation of the BMW manufacturing plant. Uh, we have one in Spartanburg, which is very close to Clemson, uh, where they actually assemble uh, one of the SUVs, the BMW SUV. So working with them, we also created interactive scenarios for manufacturing safety education. And from a manufacturing safety perspective, participants need to not only identify these safety infringements, but they also need to uh, associate those safety inf infringements with higher level abstract concepts. And those abstract concepts could be things like, for instance, if they saw an oil spill on the floor, for instance, they need to then correctly identify the, the oil spill as being a slip or fall risk. If they saw a conduit that is arcing off at a distance, then they need to then identify that arcing conduit as a fire safety hazard or a fire safety risk. So we did. Uh, we also use these simulations to study cyber sickness as well because of the visual realism of these simulations. We also created simulations to study, for instance, the uh, hydraulics uh, concepts asso associated with hydraulics and fluid dynamics. And so here's the scaffold simulation featuring scaffolded learning experiences, in which there's of course instruction, guided practice, in which uh, participants learn step by step how to perform these tasks. And uh, these, the, the, this simulation is actually a desktop simulation. And then use some of the tools with regards to creating these hydraulic fittings 
in the virtual environment. This was created by my PhD student, uh, Jeff Bertrand and David Brickler, um, who have since graduated now, by the way. So we also created uh, other types of sim uh, interactive simulations for manufacturing safety. This one involving a lathe mach machining tool in which uh, participants have to learn uh, the degrees of freedom associated with this tool, as well as uh, problems involving safety that could happen if you were to incorrectly use this tool. So for instance, if you didn't activate the magnet in this lathe, then when you actually um, put the machining part onto the lathe, then the metal block could fly off and could injure someone. So those are the kinds of things that you would learn interactively via this uh, simulation in a hands-on fashion, but this, these were desktop versions. We also created interactive versions for electrical circuitry education. So here's a screenshot of uh, uh, another PhD graduate of mine, uh, uh, Double Parmar, who actually created a bimanual interaction simulation for electrical circuitry learning so that we can interactively learn how to use the ammeter, the voltmeter, the ohmmeter, and these kinds of instruments interactively in virtual reality. And uh, uh, he also found that, uh, again, confirming those results that when you're actually uh, interacting with these objects in near field for personal space interactions using head mounted display based uh, interaction metaphors, then participants have much better performance as compared to say, interacting with these objects in screen space um, due to the visual motor offset. Um, so uh, we, we did some studies that uh, uh, involved uh, inter an, uh, a proposed interaction fidelity continuum where we actually created simulations, simulation profiles that uh, actually spanned uh, the dimensions of the FIFA continuum. Uh, this has nothing to do with soccer, by the way, um, uh, proposed by uh, Ryan McMahon et al. as part of his PhD dissertation back in 2011. And so taking some of the dimensions out of this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, interaction fidelity taxonomy, we were able to create snapshots of our simulation and study how it actually affected near field fine motor uh, skills acquisition, learning, task performance, and things like that. There were a couple of, and there were lots and lots of results. I'm just showing you some of the key ones that uh, um, I, I wanted to highlight. Uh, with regards to errors in motor task performance, from the lowest fidelity to the highest fidelity simulation, we actually found an interesting trend where motor task performance in lower dimensions of interaction were actually, uh, uh, the, the errors in motor task performance were a lot lower as compared to say mid fidelity interactions. And then the errors in uh, task performance uh, in motor task performance was also again, lower with the, in the highest fidelity interaction as well. So for some reason, mid fidelity interactions had, a, had uh, suffered from greater errors in task performance. Participants were, had conflicting cues perhaps in the context of these mid fidelity interactions. And so uh, they, they, they had a hard time sort of adapting to these mid fidelity interactions. Similarly, lower fidelity interactions and the highest fidelity of interaction also had the lowest number of errors when it, uh, uh, when it comes to the cognitive aspects of the task performance, um, making sure that the task was performed in the correct order, uh, following the, the sequence of steps uh, in the near field uh, in the, with regards to these fine motor tasks. And so one of the reasons that the uh, the, the uh, simplistic interaction metaphor may have performed well in real time as they're performing these motor tasks might be due to the fact that there are lower dimensions. And so people could essentially, participants may have, uh, this may have enabled participants to focus on the precision aspects of the task in the lower dim dimension of operation, and then also pay attention to the task much more with less distractions. Um, next, I move on to simulations, uh, back to simulations regarding healthcare. And so uh, one of the simulations that we spent a lot of time and we created a body of work that's, that has to do with emotion and visual attention with virtual humans is the rapid response training, training simulation. And so here we created an interactive VR simulation to educate nurses uh, to recognize the signs and symptoms of patient deterioration in the general ward. In the ICU, patients are monitored very well, but in the general ward, um, deterioration is often noted rather late. And one statistic is that almost 20% of patient mortality in the general ward could be prevented if intervention was given early, meaning if deterioration was, was actually identified much earlier by these nurses who are the first line of interaction with the patients, then of course, you know, they, those patients uh, could be saved. 
And so we designed and developed an interactive simulation to train users in recognizing these subtle signs of patient deterioration uh, while also learning patient monitoring and surveillance. And we started this project way back in 2012, and we have been continuously publishing up until 2019 or so. So here's an example of our, of, of, uh, our simulation. It's a dual view virtual reality simulation in which the virtual environment is rendered in a large screen display. And then you have a uh, simulated he electronic health record system on a smaller display. And then we also have eye tracking to monitor participants' visual attention behaviors. So uh, here's a, a screenshot of one of our virtual patients. His name is Bob. He's an elderly patient with uh, chronic pulmonary distress syndrome, a very common problem in South Carolina among the elderly. And so you can interact with Bob uh, by clicking on the instruments in his, uh, in his uh, vicinity in his virtual environment. And you can take a lot of his vital signs uh, from those instruments. And then you can also uh, pull down a, uh, you can specifically also interact with Bob using a stethoscope uh, to look at his lung function, his heart rate, his stomach condition, things like that. You can also pull down a drop down he menu. He came by for a few minutes. And you can ask him some predefined questions in a variety of different categories from orientation. Yes, to respiration. they made me get up to take a bath. And then when you, uh, the participant's task was to note down uh, the signs and symptoms, uh, the uh, vital signs, as well as the observations in a simulated electronic health record system on the second screen. Um, one of the things that happened to Bob, this was a, uh, uh, a, a simulation that advanced over four time steps that mimicked the 12-hour uh, shift, shift of a nurse. And so participants had to interact with Bob during which the participant wasn't told was that uh, Bob would deteriorate from one time step to another. And so here is Bob in the first time step, he looks normal. And over time, his, he has uh, uh, respiratory distress. And uh, eerily, these are symptoms similar to COVID, by the way. So it's also relevant to today, to the present circumstances. And then uh, in time step four, he's in great distress. And so the, the nurse should have called code by now. So we did a series of work, and this was the PhD dissertation of uh, my student, Matthias Volante. Uh, in which uh, we published some of this in IEEE Transactions and Visualization Computer Graphics in 2014 and 2016, in which we looked at the, how the virtual human uh, behavior fidelity and appearance fidelity affected a phenomena called emotion contagion. Emotion contagion is this phenomena of how emotions can be passed on transmitted between one person to another. And we were studying how that happens between virtual humans and users. So one of the results that we found in this very first study was that as we increased the visual realism of the virtual patient from a sketch-like rendering to a realistic-like rendering, then the perceptions of the human-like sociality of the agent and to what extent participants felt like the virtual agent was a human-like conversation partner and a social entity increased gradually um, side by side along with the visual realism. However, when we look at the emotional res response of the patient, we find that the lowest emotional response is in the lowest visual realism condition. And then the, but the highest emotional response was in the cartoon shaded condition with the realistic condition being in the middle. And one of the reasons this may have occurred is because of the fact that if uh, in the highly realistic visual, uh, uh, visual appearance condition, participants, uh, if the behavior fidelity did not catch up with the visual fidelity, then participants may fall into the uncanny valley. So they may notice a lot of these idiosyncrasies and errors in, in the virtual, uh, virtual human's behavior. So that was the, uh, one of the interesting and neat results that we found. Then we looked at the effects of virtual human conversational and affective animation and its fidelity on the visual attention, the eye gaze, uh, uh, the, uh, using eye tracking. We looked at visual attention in, in these interpersonal simulations. This was published in 2018, IEEE VR. And what we noticed was that as the virtual human deteriorated from one time step to another, participants uh, uh, focus on the environment actually decreased from one time step to another. Their interaction with the tools that allowed them to measure how the virtual patient was, was doing remained study. And, uh, and, and the additional UIs with regards to conversation with the virtual agent, as well as the instrument UIs to, to perform measurements, those kinds of the visual attention towards those UIs also increased over time, uh, converse, converse to the uh, visual attention to the environment. And then as the virtual patient deteriorated, initially 
the, uh, the uh, gaze behavior of the participants to the virtual human increased up until the very last time step. In the very last time step, the gaze behavior to the virtual human significantly decreased, and then the gaze behaviors towards the uh, instruments and the, uh, the surveillance tools actually greatly increased. So participants tended to have this kind of tunnel-like uh, uh, like focus when they actually when they were faced with stressful interpersonal situations with the virtual patient, where they had to then focus on the task-oriented behaviors, and then they ended up focusing less on the virtual human, which is actually bad because then the patient feels like uh, the uh, healthcare worker didn't pay attention to them and didn't notice. And in the process, they may have missed some of these subtle behaviors. We also varied uh, the animation fidelity and we looked at visual attention and we found that when there was no animation, obviously as a control condition, we didn't find any differences in their visual attention behaviors from one time step to another. But in the uh, absence of conversational behaviors, only passive behaviors, uh, we actually found that uh, participants' visual attention towards the virtual human in the middle time steps when he was rather stable was still quite high. And they, they kept transitioning their visual attention behaviors from the environment to the virtual agent constantly because they weren't sure what he was saying because the conversational behaviors were not there. But however, when the conversational behaviors were there, then participants' uh, visual attention towards the virtual human remained steady and did not vary as much. Uh, next up, we also looked at the interplay. We wanted to look at the cause-effect relationship between the emotional reactions of the, of the uh, trainees and visual attention. What, which one happens first? Uh, and so we, we actually uh, uh, used uh, a structural equation modeling and a cross-lagged panel type analysis in order to find out whether emotion leads to visual attention or visual attention leads to emotional changes in the virtual patient. So this was published in ACM Symposium on Applied Perception in 2019. And we actually found through the cross lag panel that uh, the, the, the emotional uh, uh, reaction of the participant in the previous time step actually enhanced their visual attention towards the virtual, a virtual agent in the next time step. And likewise, there was a cyclical effect in which the uh, visual attention towards the virtual human in the previous time step actually led to greater emotional reactions in the participant at the next time step of interaction, right? So we found this type of effect, which was really interesting. And then furthermore, we wanted to see to what extent uh, visual attention actually mediated emotion uh, in these participants. And we actually found that uh, uh, the visual attention did in fact mediate emotion to a, a vast degree with regards to the emotion of distress and fear that Bob is going to die on the table here uh, as, the, as the time steps wore on, uh, part, we found that visual attention greatly mediated uh, the emotional reactions of the participants. And so visual attention maybe is, is important in terms of eliciting the appropriate emotional reactions and happens first. So, uh, and last but not least, uh, the, we looked at the rendering fidelity and visual attention. And so we looked at, uh, we came up with this notion of a appearance fidelity continuum for our virtual humans. And we looked at uh, appearance from uh, the lowest fidelity in terms of the environment and the virtual human appearing in the lowest fidelity of rendering, let's say sketch, to where the virtual human and the environment was all rendered in the highest fidelity. And then we also looked at some contrasting type of um, uh, situations in which uh, the virtual human and the, uh, and in the middle of course was a cartoon shaded condition in which the environment and the virtual human was also rendered in a cartoon shaded manner. So uh, we also had these uh, other interesting variations in which the virtual agent was rendered in a lower fidelity of rendering while the environment was rendered in a higher fidelity of rendering. And so uh, uh, we, we looked at uh, uh, a, the visual attention behaviors spanning all these conditions. And what we actually found that the visual attention towards the virtual human in this condition in which the virtual human was rendered in a different uh, shading uh, algorithm as compared to the virtual the background, the environment, uh, either as a sketch or as a cartoon shaded condition elicited greater amount of visual attention. So, and then later on at the end of the experiment, we actually asked the participant, did you notice something odd about the simulation? None of them in these two conditions in which the virtual agent was rendered in a different shading algorithm as compared to the environment, said that there, this was, there was something going on with regards to the rendering of the virtual agent. So 
that, that was interesting that they didn't notice this effect at all. They were so focused on the task. But we did see that visual attention was greater when this kind of effect is there. So one of the, uh, uh, the take home messages here is that if you want to, in a subtle manner, elicit greater visual attention towards the virt virtual human, then one of the ways by which you can do that is by using uh, a, a shading contrast between your, uh, your entity of interest as compared to the objects in the environment. So here are some takeaways from, uh, from all this. So uh, with regards to near field psychomotor skills learning, when designing and creating, evaluating simulations for training and education, include the stakeholders. I'm sure Ben talked about this as well in his talk, which is include learning science experts, application domain experts uh, from those fields, as well as educators. Don't try to design this on your own. So uh, that's a, an important lesson that I learned over many years of doing this. Number two, in near field fine motor skills training, participants seem to have greater perception action coordination due to uh, enhanced depth and uh, spatial perception in the near field when they're interacting with objects in the personal space. And that then leads to greater motor control and in, per in personal space interactions instead of in screen space interactions. So when facilitating personal space interactions, participant task performance also showed greater uh, accuracy, effectiveness of performing the task and learning the task, precision and economy of motion, which means lack of wasted end effector movement and also in terms of the time it took to complete the task. From a cognitive perspective, we see that learning and skills transfer related to near field fine motor tasks can be achieved via both simpler and high fidelity interaction metaphors. However, if you wanna emphasize motor skills learning and transfer to the real world, then the, with regards to near field fine motor tasks, you may require high, higher fidelity interaction metaphors in which you're leveraging bimanual symmetry, simulation fidelity, end effector co-location, and also leveraging personal space near field interactions as best as you can to enhance perception action coordination. From the, uh, the, work, the body of work that we did on emotion contagion visual attention, uh, I have three main takeaways that I wanna share with you. Emotion, emotional interactions can facilitate learning. There's, you know, researchers have known this for a long time that there's a connection between emotion and cognition. So uh, by having participants elicit the appropriate emotions, they're able to learn the key uh, abstract and concrete principles related to the complex tasks like patient monitoring and surveillance. And emotion is mediated by visual attention, which means that uh, using rendering styles and contrast, you can grab the attention of the participant in subtle ways to the entity of interest that you want them to focus on. And in stressful interpersonal situations, we have noticed that participants tend to avert their gaze from the virtual human and uh, towards other goal-oriented artifacts, and they tend to have tunnel vision, so to speak, which leads to a break in engagement and also a break in emotional reactions to the virtual human. So, and uh, behavior fidelity is the last point is that behavior fidelity must catch up with visual fidelity. So if you emphasize visual fidelity of your virtual humans, don't forget visual fidelity so that you don't uh, fall into the uncanny valley and you don't have uh, uh, negative emotional engagement with, the, with your virtual humans in these simulated interpersonal situations. Um, so uh, with that, I just wanna quickly acknowledge uh, the funding agencies, uh, industry sponsors, universities. Um, uh, I'm just sort of uh, the speaker here of all of this work, but this was mainly done by, by my six PhD graduates uh, who worked with me over the years and did a lot of all of these works. And they were supported by the master's graduates and undergraduate honors students that I had the privilege of working with and my collaborators. And my students won't forgive me if I don't advertise for their talks coming up at the conference this year. So we have three papers, one of which is in the multimodal VR session and uh, the two papers in the virtual humans and agents session. So with that, I'll stop and take any questions that you might have. Thank you so much for your, for your attention to my talk. Um, thank you, Sam. Uh, I think it was a, an excellent uh, talk. Uh, and it's really nice to, 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 to see this overview of, of this uh, big body of work you have done. I, I, I think many of us here in this workshop have a reference in your work and will do in the future. So it, it's nice now, now to have a, a complete picture and actually the face uh, behind the work or one of the faces. So uh, very nice. Um, we'll take some questions. Uh, we already have one uh, from Pablo asking, 
Um, how reusable do you think your apps are? Um, I, I apologize. Can you repeat that question for me, please? How um, reusable do you think uh, your applications are? Um, a very good question. Thank you, Pablo, for asking that question and good to see you. Um, <clears throat> So we, uh, we, we did several studies uh, involving the usability of our desktop simulations. Um, our, uh, our student learners in our partnering technical colleges actually preferred these desktop simulations as compared to VR back when we developed them uh, in the 2016, 2017, 2018 timeframe because of the fact that they can, um, they can learn these skills anytime, anywhere. And we also did, uh, uh, and, uh, and those participants, uh, those trainees actually found the simulations to be uh, usable, useful, easy to learn, uh, effective in terms of learning these concepts. And uh, uh, when we did uh, pre and post test type questionnaires with them, we found that uh, participants uh, learning was greatly improved associated with those concepts. And we published also some papers in the ASWE journals uh, where we compared those simulations against video and lecture-based learning alone, just instruction only or video-based simulations. And we found that the, those interactive simulations were much more effective from a, uh, from a learning perspective and the self-perceived usability from the students were very high. For the healthcare associated simulations, we ran a very large study at our partnering hospital, St. Francis Hospital, with 75 nurses who used the, uh, the rapid response training simulation to learn uh, the, the patient safety, patient monitoring relevant practices. And they found these simulations to be very useful. And they, they, it, uh, they found it to replicate to a, uh, a large degree uh, the change uh, in patient's behavior across the 12 hour shift of a nurse. Um, surprisingly, we found that uh, often, many times, some of the nurses, some of these novice nurses, didn't call code on the patient uh, on Bob, even in the very last time step, when his periodicity of coughing was very high, his distress levels were very, very high. So we still, we still feel like even novice nurses need uh, constant training, and there's something to be said about the importance of using virtual reality tools for continuous workforce development in any domain so that uh, the, the, uh, uh, those technicians and practitioners can constantly hone in their skills. I'm sorry, I probably said much more than what you- No, 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 uh, I think it's wonderful hearing the answer. And, and I think you were on point. Uh, Maybe I can add something as well in the question, in the second part of Pablo's question. Uh, what the future holds? So, so we've seen a lot of results, uh, very wonderful, and, and uh, you gave us um, some depiction of uh, how we should design and some key uh, points here, but, but what the future uh, will hold? Do you see adaptiveness being part uh, of, the, of, of the future in, in uh, motor skills training? A lot of discussion is about including sensors, including uh, more adaptive systems and, and providing a more tailor-made uh, approach for, for the training it is something that you are looking at. That's, uh, thank you. Thank you for those. Thank you for that question. It's, it's, a, it's a loaded question. Lots of things there. Um, one of the things that I would address is with regards to customization, personalization of these training tools. Uh, that is something that uh, uh, researchers have been thinking about for a very long time, is how to customize it in such a manner um, uh, so that uh, trainees may find it uh, useful, uh, effective from a learning perspective. Uh, maybe we have trainees who are visual learners. We have trainees who are rote learners. So maybe content customization could potentially be effective for them. And I think uh, there's something to be said about leveraging uh, novels, uh, sensors, and uh, uh, AI algorithms, machine learning algorithms, in order to be able to continuously do that and uh, to see its benefits play out to some extent. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, learning sciences uh, researchers also tell me that such customization, if, you're, if you don't, uh, if, if you may overdo it, for instance, you may also be providing a cognitive prosthetic for those learners. They may not be able to expand 
their learning skills so that they can learn. Uh, so it's not only about learning the task, but there are secondary skills that you may want the trainees to learn. And if you over customize for that trainee, for example, then you may, uh, you may detract from the broader learning uh, uh, goals of that simulation, right? Through over customization. So the learning sciences researchers I work with also caution me about that, about doing that to a large extent. Um, and uh, uh, there's also something to be said about longitudinal experiences and long-term experiences, which we don't know. So if, uh, to what extent do, you know, we are, we are always taking a snapshot in our experiments in the lab where uh, we give these simulations to our students and we take a snapshot of how uh, learning has improved from pre to post or what have you. But I, I think much research also needs to be conducted in terms of following learners over time and see how their VR experience moderates their learning benefits over the year, uh, over maybe you know, weeks, months, et cetera. And also how does prior, uh, 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 prior experience in virtual reality also moderate participants' learning experiences? So we know that more and more people, because of the fact that these, back when I started this research, uh, almost 17, 18 years ago, devices were so expensive. Most of us know that. And so, but now we are able to get these devices at low cost and they're easily accessible. So a lot of the learners that I encounter uh, may have these devices sitting at home and they wanna use that in the context of learning. They may use it for entertainment or what have you. So uh, how, how does the, uh, their prior experience in VR applications actually moderate the learning effectiveness is also an open question that I think we should investigate as well from a human factors perspective. Those I think are future opportunities. Most definitely, I totally agree. We performed a literature review on the field as well, and we've seen that the span of, of testing, uh, it, it was very, very uh, small. Uh, I mean, we consider a long time, two weeks after the training, and, and that's not enough. We've seen from medical studies that we need to further this and, and try to find uh, where that learning is decaying. Uh, but but I think this is for now. Uh, I think we we'll run a little bit over time, but but it's always nice uh, talking to you. Uh, and uh, I, as you said, maybe we can take some questions uh, when your papers are presented. So uh, we welcome um, that part as well. Uh, so I, I think we will close um, the workshop. I would like also to thank uh, all the participants, all the authors, and uh, of course all the reviewers that that helped us. Uh, with the papers, um, and uh, I hope to to see everybody uh, physical next year. I think that's that's an important uh, message as well. Christos or any of the other uh, co-organizers have anything to add? Nothing special. Thanks for you know, participating, and we hope to see you next year again. Yeah, see you next year. Thank you. Thank you. Great to see you all. Good. Enjoy the, In, the conference. Enjoy the conference, yes. Thank you. Bye. Bye, thank you. Thank you, bye. Thanks everybody. Okay, so this is it. <laughs> see you. Bye. Yeah, bye.